in, in their net zero targets at all with integrity. So that is a huge problem. This is why accuracy is a huge problem. We have this huge reduction potential of 80% if you just take a thousand businesses. But in order for that act to be fulfilled, we need to bridge that accuracy gap where value chains are actually properly included uh, in uh, those net zero targets. So what, what is the reason? What is the reason for, for this non-inclusion of value chains in, in net zero targets, which is really threatening the integrity of those targets? Well, first of all, it is an accuracy gap in terms of carbon accounting and calculations. And we see this over and over again, that most businesses fail to adequately calculate and account for a proper baseline in their scope three. And there's you know, several figures that, that shows and, and, and highlight this fact. And that leads to underreporting in the end of the day. So the carbon disclosures that you see in the uh, emission reports of a lot of businesses end up not being the full picture uh, because they exclude the value chain. And that, in the end, leads to those insufficient targets where value chains are not seriously being taken into account in those net zero commitments, even though they need to be according to the definition of net zero. And this is not just good for you know, the ethics of it. It is also good for business in the end of the day. Um, so if, here is a couple of figures of that. You know, 12 trillion in annual revenue, uh, revenues are being unlocked for the transition by, by 2030. Uh, so there's a huge, huge advantage to be had of, of being early in that transition. And then you also have the consumer sentiment. Most consumers are willing to pay a premium for products that are deemed sustainable. And then thirdly, there's the employment engagement aspect where over 50% of employees are uh, drawn to firms with some sort of you know, uh, environmental policies with, with teeth. So the way we work to bridge this accuracy gap in normative is in, in, in three ways. So we make sure that the companies that we work with have comprehensive coverage. So we account for every single uh, invoice, every single input and output of the business to make sure we have that comprehensive coverage. Um, we also work with that in a very automated way that is integrated into the ERP systems of our clients. And, and then thirdly, we need to do this with scientific integrity, uh, where you can actually trust the numbers uh, in the end of the day. So that was to set the scene a little bit of why accuracy is really important to the integrity of uh, the entire idea of net zero and for that to stay alive. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Christian, for uh, giving this overview. You can hold on to the microphone for just one second. I have a, a follow-up question. So there's also a risk if we don't close the accuracy gap in terms of the integrity and the business credibility and the net zero targets and the whole industry going down for greenwash. What are your reactions to that and how do you view that? To me, this is incredibly worrying um, because it's, it's not just worrying that business as greenwash in the first place, it's, I think, in worrying to the entire integrity of the project of net zero. I mean, right now, people around the world are starting to question, like, does it even mean anything if someone says they're net zero? And that will decrease incentives for companies to set near net zero targets in the first place. So I'm, I'm really kind of genuinely worried that it might just be seen as, you know, one of those cute CSR things uh, in, in the end of the day if we don't close that accuracy gap. Thank you for that reflection. We're going to have you back in a minute on stage, but for now you can sit down and rest your legs for a moment. Uh, we have some businesses that have joined us online for today's discussion. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Lisa Bolin from uh, Polestar Climate Lead, who will join us. Let's see if we can get her up on the big screen. So Lisa from 
Polestar. Let's see if we can get the technology working. I don't think it would be a real session without some technical issues. Let's see. While we're waiting for Lisa, I can introduce the companies that we have coming. Uh, so, uh, can you hear me? Now we can oh, hear you and see okay. you. Wonderful. Maybe I, maybe I need to speak to be able to be on the big screen. I don't know. So I, I'll have to keep talking without any pause at all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and exactly. Okay. So the question that we've asked you for today uh, is what is the key issue with accurate data reporting and how can it be fixed? So please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, my name is Lisa Bolin and I'm working as climate lead at Polestar. Quickly, I will just say something about Polestar. We are an EV brand. Uh, we're only making uh, electric vehicles um, and uh, we have been around as a, a standalone company for about uh, three years and um, so we are, I mean, we created our baseline in reporting in 2020, which is quite maybe unusual for, uh, because many companies started early in that. But we were not a company until then, so we had to start at that point. Um, yeah, so Christian was mentioning the scope of, of climate reporting and, uh, and climate uh, what climate emissions you as a company actually take responsibility for. And I think that is the first step. Uh, we have a target to become net zero in 2040 and also to have emissions per sold car in 2030. Um, and we include um, scope one, two, three in our reporting. And that includes, of course, the supply chains, but also the use of our products downstream. And this means that our absolute biggest contributors um, to emissions that we as a company take responsibility for is the supply chains, the scope three um, upstreams, we can call it, and the uh, use of our product. Because not every, every customer is able to charge only renewable electricity, right? So there are still uh, emissions connected to the use of our products. Uh, this means that um, in that sense, I think to set the scope correctly, that's just something that you have to do. And uh, I think that is um, the easy part, maybe, to take that responsibility. But the big challenge that we see is that um, to get proper data from supply chain. And why do we need that? I mean, we can we can use public or or databases with lca data and so on to calculate the emissions connected to our supply chain but if we want to see the actual actual changes um that we that we implement and the effects of those then we of course need to know the real baseline not only some generic data so this is something that is really um, a challenge because that's a huge amount of data that needs to be collected um, and therefore well we also need to work with other indicators not I mean we cannot wait with actions until we have the full data set right so this is something that I really want to point out that we know the drivers for climate neutrality right efficiency renewable energy um, so these we can work with in our supply chains and set KPIs for those, even if we don't have every supplier being able to report in the whole value chain, being able to report their carbon emissions. I mean, there is no problem for us to get the carbon emissions from our tier one suppliers, but very few of our emissions are actually connected to tier one suppliers. They are usually further down the supply chains. And we cannot wait until we have perfect reporting uh, down in tier two, three and four, uh, we have to act now. And that's why we put, for example, KPIs like renewable energy, percent of renewable energy in the supply chain, because we know that drives a positive change. Um, so, yeah, I think that it's important to think about um, why we do 
the reporting, what is the aim, right? The aim itself is not to report, it doesn't have a value in itself. The aim is to make changes that leads us to, to, to um, minimize or uh, eliminate the emissions. So, um, yeah, that's, we, as an example, we have a lot of our supply chains in China and it isn't easy for us always to get report, get suppliers down, downstream in the value chains, if you call it like that, or upstream, I don't know, <laughs> um, to, to report a perfect climate reporting according to greenhouse gas protocol. So we need to use this kind of indicators as well um, to, to be able to, to drive a change. Um, yeah, I think maybe, I don't know if you have more questions or I should just keep talking. <laughs> A follow-up question, but we also have a schedule to keep and many businesses that will share their examples. So I thank you for the great example that you shared and how you work. I really take with me, start act acting now. Uh, don't wait to be perfect, but start engaging. So it's not just a reporting exercise, but you actually follow through with what you worked with. But I'd be mm. very curious for you, to hear from you. What's the response when you do engage their value chain? What what have you heard from the suppliers that you work with in terms of the demands uh, that you set on them? It, it's, it's the whole spectrum, I will say. Um, I mean, we're not alone in putting certain requirements on suppliers, even further down the supply chains. So, I mean, if you call, talk about big aluminium suppliers, smelters, uh, big steel suppliers, of course, they have Many of them have heard similar requirements before, probably. So they are not shocked. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can always live up to requirement. But um, so it, it's absolutely um, very different. Uh, smaller suppliers can be frustrated. <laughs> we, but the important thing that we don't we don't present the requirement and just then leave them with that and just solve that the best you can. We have to support. Um, as well, and we try to do that as much as we can to really um, see how we can work together. Because if you look at, for example, aluminium, steel, and battery suppliers, those are the suppliers that will, they will, how to say, if they don't decarbonize, we can never reach our goals. So it just makes sense for us to really engage with them and collaborate rather than just put forward a requirement and let them trying to solve it the best they can. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that and for joining us here today at uh, COP27. Um, moving on to our next uh, speaker, we have uh, Stina Klingvall from Volvo Cars, uh, Manager Climate Action. Uh, Stina, addressing the same question, the key issues with accurate data reporting and how it can be fixed. Yes, thank you and hello everyone. So, as was um, alluded to in the presentation here in the beginning, for OEMs and many other companies, our value chain emissions, our scope 3 emissions, are actually the absolute majority of emissions. And for Volvo cars, uh, our scope 3 emissions uh, up and downstream are actually over 99% of our total emissions. So it's, of course, our absolute highest priority to work on the emissions up and downstream our value chain. And we have set the ambition to be a climate neutral company by 2040. And we're also committed to becoming a fully electric company by 2030 to, to tackle the emissions in our value chain. But also we know that is not enough. We also need to work in our supply chain, as Elisa talked about. Uh, we have um, the key emission sources in our supply chain is steel, aluminium, and batteries. And to drive those emissions down, we are collaborating with, for example, SSAB, who I know are also here today, and Northvolt and others to really collaborate and work together to, to drive down these emissions as much as possible. But I wanted to also mention, um, sort of connecting to the presentation here before, that just setting uh, ambitious targets is not enough either. That is perhaps why we see that so many companies are setting net zero targets, climate neutrality targets, but still emissions continue to increase. So what we see is that targets that are set need to be really integrated into the operating model of the company, 
we need to work with them on the, in our daily business and make sure that CO2 is actually integrated in all company decisions throughout our entire processes to make sure that we always know the CO2 impact of decisions we take and that we are able to forecast where we are heading in the future so we know the impact of our emissions from the, from the decisions we take on the daily basis. Much like cost is um, always integrated in the decisions, CO2 has to be as well. So that is something that we see is very important for actually being able to reach these emission reduction targets that are being set by so many. And we see that too few companies are talking about today how to actually operationalize the CO2 targets and get it into the strategy. And this looks very different for different companies, of course. For some, like we mentioned, aluminium producers, for example, perhaps it is one very big investment decision that has to be taken. But for other companies with a very broad product for portfolio, there might be a lot of many small decisions. So this is something that we really need to uh, talk more about, I feel, as businesses, how we operationalize the targets. And uh, in all of this, when it comes to standards and accuracy and reporting, uh, that is, of course, a crucial prerequisite to be able to take the right decisions and make the right actions towards reducing emissions. So, for example, we have set an internal carbon price of 1,000 sec per ton, that is around 100 euro per ton. Um, to, and, but to be able to act on this, we need to make sure that we can trust the data that we get from suppliers. As Lisa mentioned as well, there are, of course, a lot of different suppliers in the value chains, and we need to be able to compare and be confident about those emissions of different suppliers to be able to take the right decisions in our purchasing and in our sourcing. So that is something that is a very important um, aspect of the accuracy in reporting and also standardization. And in a wider perspective, we also want to see common LCA standards uh, for products such as cars, so that it's possible to compare two different products to each other for not least for stakeholders and investors, for customers, but also for consumers. So they are able to understand which of two products are actually the most sustainable and use their purchasing power to, to go for the more sustainable option. And that is something that is very difficult today, much because of this uh, sort of unaligned reporting and, uh, and standardization. So that is another point which I think is very uh, important to highlight in this context. And uh, lastly, I just want to say that we really would like to see a big step being taken in terms of reporting accuracy and standardization, because it would, it would help reward those who are making good progress and increase transparency, which is very much needed. Thank you for that. Uh, increased transparency for sure and also picking up what you said about the challenge with working with your supply chain and the accuracy in the data coming from businesses that might be smaller than yours, that might not have the same resources than you do. Fully understand that. But I want to ask you a question as well in terms, you talk a lot about the action and, and you know, starting to working actively. Is there an innovation gap for you to meet your action targets? And is that something that you're working with to have the solutions in place also to make those reductions that are required for your business? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, of course there is, because we have set the climate neutrality target for 2040, but we know there are a lot of um, sort of materials, for example, mentioning perhaps electronics, where the solutions to reach climate neutrality, reach net zero are not there. And, I mean, so much has happened in the last couple of years when it comes to, for example, steel, who is really on a transition journey right now. But there are a lot of other sectors that are very hard to abate, as, as they're usually called, where the solutions are not yet there. So I think that innovation gap is definitely there. And it is something that I think we will talk a lot more about in the coming years. Uh, but uh, as well, I want to say that for some of our major emission sources, when it comes to as we mentioned, steel, aluminium, batteries, and also electricity, of course, the solutions are there. So uh, we can do very much with, uh, with the solutions that are existing or are on the way of becoming um, commercial. So uh, yes, there is an innovation gap, but there is a lot that can be done. 
I love that. A lot that can be done. That might be the theme that goes throughout the session today. Uh, now we have Jenny Janfeldt Nord from Einride, uh, ESG director from the Business Sweden studio. Welcome. Same question to you. Thank you. Super happy to be here. So my name is uh, Jenny. And for those who don't know who Enride uh, are, we are a freight technology company providing shipping solutions based on electric, autonomous and digital technology. Now, the transportation industry has uh, been, uh, let's call it slow in adapting to new technologies and also in reducing emissions. And uh, we need to rethink today's logistics system uh, to create a green and smart transportation ecosystem. And that's what we do at Enride. Uh, but then uh, talking about the, uh, the challenges and key issues with, with climate data reporting, I'll mention three. The first one, of course, being the challenge of the largest emissions for most companies are in their indirect uh, scope, as previous speakers have talked. I think uh, we just heard 99% from Volvo cars. But we think it's really important to... Uh, uh, we think that we have an opportunity to impact uh, these emissions as well. So with an open and transparent dialogue with our upstream supply chain partners and our downstream customers, we can uh, have actions that lead to carbon emission reductions, we can have actions that lead to cost saving, and we can also have actions that could potentially lead to revenue uh, opportunities. Um, the second challenge I want to mention is, of course, the different standards. So there are many different standards, uh, and I agree that we need to have a common standard, but I also think that we need to have a common methodology within the standard. So within transport emissions, it's possible to choose your methodology within the standard, making it really difficult for us in supplier selection, but also for investors and looking to compare uh, companies. And the third uh, issue I wanted to mention is primary data. Uh, it should be the preferred data. And uh, it's important, in addition to your annual emissions, to look at the whole life cycle of your emissions, which is what we offer our customers. Uh, and I know measuring scope three is tricky, uh, to say the least, but I think that uh, it's important to remember that we need to take action. We need to reduce emissions and we need to mitigate them. I mean, that's the focus. We, we've been hearing from previous speakers. We know where the hotspots are and now is the time for action. So the road freight industry accounts for 8% of global emissions today and uh, electrifying road transport will significantly reduce that. And with our intelligent solutions, we can provide our customers with accurate, transparent, and primary data. So those are, our, those are my uh, key issues for today. Leaving it back to you. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. So I'm a little bit curious, when you have these discussions, uh, you're mentioning that you're part of others' value chains with the solution that you're offering. Is it more a requirement saying that we need this from you, or is it more a business opportunity that you win business because you are one step ahead when it comes to your data and the solution that you're providing? Yeah, I think it's actually both. I mean, having a, a really close relationship with your suppliers can lead to many th different things. And the same goes with having a really close dialogue with your customers and jointly looking at uh, reducing emissions, but also opportunities. Thank you. Staying in the Business Sweden studio now from Stockholm, we have with us uh, Erika Sundell, uh, Impact Manager at Doconomy. So key issues with accurate data reporting and how can it be fixed from your perspective? Thank you. Also happy to be invited to this event and thank you for very good perspectives from all of you here today. Yes, so I, I represent um, the solution provider um, and digital tools uh, that, can, uh, actually, that can be used to, to calculate footprints. And we are actually uh, at Economy 
very much dependent on this reported data by companies and that it is accurate and uh, complete data available because that's the foundation of the tools that we're providing. When we do our calculations, we actually use the reported data by companies that is out there. So this is key to us that this is uh, improved. I mean, both the uh, available data, the, the, the amount of data that is reported, but also the quality, of course. Uh, so it's a very important topic. But I think um, one thing that I want to highlight also, uh, there are many pieces of the puzzles, puzzle, of course, for this very complex question. But that's also what, what we're really after here is progress, right? So it's not just uh, good data itself, but it's actually progress and, and reduction of emissions. And I think today we are seeing too little of focus on that. We see a lot of focus on targets that are set by companies, but quite uh, I'm missing the focus on the progress, uh, publicly available uh, monitoring and attention to what's actually um, happening uh, within the companies after they set the target and seeing the problem. I mean, even if there's uh, lack in the data, there's still some data there. And I think we can see the trends already if we would start uh, scrutinizing the, the reported data that is already out there. It would be really interesting to see more of that. I, we can see some reports sometimes looking at sectors, how they're developing, but more focus on the companies also. We know a lot about the financial data and how that's progressing uh, on company level, but not so much about the environmental data. And I think that should be much more balanced because this is really, really crucial information for, for the public, for everyone to see. Um, so that's one pers perspective I think I want to highlight. Um, then of course, um, we know that there is increasing uh, regulations coming, which is very, very good and important. Uh, policies are changing quite fast. Uh, and I agree uh, what's already been mentioned here that um, standardized methodology is really important and trying to have um, the, the new regulations coming as sort of uh, similar as possible uh, globally, of course, that would be very helpful. But I think we will see uh, due to this change uh, a lot of increased data reporting, which is good and, as mentioned, very welcomed. And that, in turn, will hopefully help all of these companies. As you mentioned, it's very difficult to get, get good data from, for example, your supply chain. So hopefully that will, um, it will increase and improve when you get more suppliers actually uh, reporting the data due to the new regulations coming. So that's something I, um, I'm hoping to see. And then, of course, one part is responsibility as well. We mentioned it already, but even if there is standards and there are uh, regulations coming, it's up to the companies, but also uh, us as solution providers to make sure that we, we really follow these uh, regulations and these standards properly uh, and that we uh, hold the high quality that is, I think, uh, that we should expect from also the environmental data, not just the financial data. So, yeah, we all need to pitch in here to, to um, do what we can already. <laughs> Thank you. I would actually like to follow up with a question. So standardization is something I take with me, data integrity and the precision of data, that's something that we discuss a lot as well with the economy. Um, but what's the role of collaborations and kind of forming partnerships in all of this? I know you worked a lot with that. Can you comment on it? Yeah, that's, uh, of course. I mean, that's, that's also key because that's also part of transparency. If we all work together uh, with what sort of the, the knowledge and the perspectives uh, that we have, uh, I think we will speed up this, this change uh, much, much more. And we, have, we all have different angles, different information, different competence. So, so the more we work together, of course, and transpar in a transparent way, uh, the better. It's time to, to sort of just be very, very open about what we have and what we don't have, the gaps, uh, and start sharing more. I think that's really important here. Thank you. Um, that was the contribution we had from our digital panel. It's time to move on to the next part of the session. We have with us today, we get Christian back on the stage, CEO and co-founder of Normative. We have Martin Pei, uh, Chief Technology Officer at SSAB. Uh, Anders Egelrud, uh, CEO of Stockholm Exergy. And 
Sean Mallon, Global Lead for uh, Climate Business Network at WWF. Uh, welcome. So, we have one microphone for you to share. And I will start with your first question. Hearing how they were working with closing the accuracy gap, engaging value chains, what is your kind of uh, first reaction? We saw some common challenges, right? Data coming from the supply chain, how do you engage them? How do you trust the data coming up? Because that's at the end of the day what your business is measured on. Um, do you want to comment on it, Martin, from your perspective? Obviously, you have a complex value chain to work with. Yes, I can start. Thank you for uh, inviting us uh, to this panel. Uh, we, are, uh, we have been working uh, for many years uh, very hard uh, along the value chain because as we heard from both Polestar and uh, Volvo cars, uh, steel is uh, an extremely important uh, material for, uh, for them. And we are a steel company and we are... Uh, dependent on uh, cooperating with our partners. We can solve uh, our part of the emission problem, uh, but we need to really collaborate uh, with the whole value chain. So our scope uh, one and scope two, that we can work to cut to almost zero, that we have shown that uh, uh, with a hybrid technology that we have developed jointly with LKB Vattenfall, we can take away the root cause of CO2 emission when making steel from iron ore. Uh, instead of uh, emitting worldwide 7% of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, the technology we developed uh, jointly with uh, using phosphate hydrogen, that produces water as a, uh, a byproduct. And I have actually a bottle of water from the hybrid uh, pilot plant trials. And this uh, can be recycled, of course, and this uh, it can be possible uh, to drink again. Uh, so that really takes away the big portion of uh, uh, need for decarbonization along the value chain. So then our customers like uh, Volvo Group, Volvo Cars and Polestar and others, uh, when they use uh, the phosphate-free steel, they get rid of that emission. So working with this uh, type of uh, collaborations uh, jointly, that is the key for the whole society to solve the climate uh, challenge. And that uh, we believe is extremely important. Collaboration is really what we need to do. Fully agree. Collaboration keeps coming back as a theme. Uh, Christian, I'm going to pass a kind of a tough question for you. I like tough questions. I hope you do too. Um, so many argue that we fixed normal accounting, financial accounting. Why haven't we fixed carbon accounting yet? For, first of all, fixing normal accounting took us around 600 years. I mean, it was first introduced double entry bookkeeping 600 years ago in Venice by merchants. It was standardized around 100 years ago. And together with that standardization, we built a whole auditing industry around it. And then it was digitized maybe 40 years ago for the first time. And we need to do all of that, you know, in only a few years. Uh, so, so that is the answer. But I think we can do it because we have the blueprint of how to do it, right? I mean, we need the accounting standard that creates standardized disclosures. We need standards for how the data is audited to assure quality. Uh, we, we know how to build all of those things because we already have the blueprint. Yes, Sean, I see you want to jump in. Yeah, it's just worth noting that it's in their benefit to have good financial accounting systems it's not in their benefit to have good carbon accounting. Sorry. So most companies don't want to add a layer of scrutiny onto their work to show there's always a negative association with carbon emissions. So they want to hide this. They don't want to do this. So that's why we do need legislation to make it mandatory. So we have to even that playing field. And following up on that, I mean, we talked about legislation, which is kind of the stick end of things, but there's also the carrot, the business opportunity. Martin, do you want to comment on that, what you see the business opportunity is for you to be at the forefront when it comes to carbon reductions? Yes, definitely. For the, for the steel industry, which is uh, uh, extremely important for the whole modern society, because we need steel to almost everything make uh, drinking water, to produce electricity, to build uh, buildings, uh, airports, and so on. So we need steel. 
but currently the steel industry has uh, been part of the problem because uh, of this uh, very big emission. Now we see really with this uh, innovation, the technology solution, we see new business opportunities. Now with this uh, fossil free steel, we can uh, take away our scope one, scope two emissions. Uh, Volvo, Volvo cars and uh, Polestar and others, they can solve a big part of their scope three emissions. So we create uh, a lot of business opportunities along the value chain. So that is uh, extremely important to see this is not a burden for us, this is a new opportunity for the whole industry. That is absolutely a great comment that your business opportunity also trickles on becoming others' business opportunities, the kind of rings on the water spreading the positive work that is being done. Um, do you want to follow up on that, uh, Anders? You are obviously at the heart of uh, many value chains. Uh, how do you see this role and, and how do you work as being that uh, um, supply chain partner? Yeah, maybe first of all, I mean, essential for everything is carbon and energy. Without carbon and energy, you have nothing. So as an energy supplier, of course, we have early realized that we need to do the reduction so that we can have green energy. But when we are doing that journey, we can also realize that that's not enough. That will not be enough to meet the Paris Agreement. We need to continue and there will be residuals for each and one of us, which will be very, very hard to abate. And that was actually the starting point of our journey to see how can we actually also create removal from energy production. And, and that's what we are actually are, are doing in our project where, where carbon capture from biogenic CO2 can be stored permanently for 40,000 years. And, and then coming to climate calculations, I think that is one of our starting point, but we could clearly see that our scope one then reductions, they will be negative. If we are taking away CO2 from the flue gases, we will have negative scope one emissions. And of course, how will they be measured then in the scope freeze emissions for other companies? Because there will be residuals in many, many, many sectors and in many, many companies and also in household. Uh, so, so I think the accuracy of calculating is of crucial importance because otherwise you, we, will just, we will just fool ourselves. We think we are climate neutral. We see so many companies set, set up a target of being climate neutral. And, and I'm just wondering how can that be possible? Because if I only produce green electricity in our company, we are not climate neutral. So how can, how can then other companies be there? So I think then this calculation is crucial to show also that we need two trajectories. One, the trajectory is for reducing fossil emissions, and the other trajectory is actually to remove fossil, or remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So that's my input. Can, can I add quickly to yes, that? Sure. Uh, so I talk a lot about the curse of multiplicativity when it comes to carbon offsets and carbon removals. And, and that is related to what you just said. We have today a lot of companies that are claiming to be carbon neut neutral, but they do so on a faulty baseline. So they might not include all of their emissions in the baseline. That is the basis for the carbon offsets. And then, you know, the carbon that they're releasing, that will stay in the atmosphere for, you know, thousands of years. And they might plant trees that might, might only be around for, you know, uh, 5, 20, you know, 10 years. It, it depends on the project, right? So they're, they're, it's not comparable. So if you multiply those, you account for 10% of your overall emissions. And then the carbon offsets that you buy actually only remove a, a tenth or a hundredth of what it's supposed to be. You might have companies today that claim to be carbon neutral, but they've only moved, you know, 0.1% of their overall emissions. So, so we need standardized in, in all chains, you know, we need it on, on the removal side, uh, we, we certainly need it on the carbon accounting side and, and everything else that I've talked about. And Christian, 
I'd like to follow up with a question to you here as well. Uh, we work with many, many businesses across different sectors. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the classic uh, net zero journey is for a business and the kind of work and hotspots that they have to engage with? Yeah, so I'm, I'm more than happy to do that, obviously. I mean, the m most important thing is to get, you know, a good enough baseline. I mean, I've, I've talked about accuracy a, a lot here, uh, but I also actually agree with some, I think, you know, a few of the previous speakers said, we, we can't let perfection be the enemy of good. Accuracy is only useful to the extent that it gives you the right insights of the actions that you take. You know, data is not going to solve the problem. It is the actions that are based on data that are going to solve the problem. So our approach is, first of all, we assure completeness of scope. We do that by analyzing the invoices of all of our clients. That's basically in the inputs and outputs of the business, right? Uh, so then you get some sort of hotspot of what might the largest suppliers or the largest categories be. Then the important part is to engage them because in the end, your scope three emissions is just the sum of the scope one emissions of your value chain. So, so you need to engage them uh, and make sure that they uh, switch to uh, renewable types of energy. Uh, they switch to uh, you know, re steel that is uh, free from carbon, uh, concrete and all of those new technologies that are being uh, developed. And, and that is uh, how you do it in the end of the day. And it's not something that you can do over a day. I mean, value chains take for many enterprises several decades to build. So to decarbonize them will take several decades as well. So you need to start with the right actionable insights so you get the most bang for the buck if you are going to pour, you know, billions and billions in this uh, decarbonization journey. And can you give a concrete example of someone we worked with to close this accuracy gap and get that accuracy in data? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, so we worked with uh, Hitachi Rail, uh, SCB uh, recently announced that we're working with uh, Nordea, um, Flying Tiger, and uh, Vitamin Well, and uh, many, many others. We, we worked with hundreds of businesses and, and uh, thousands of suppliers. Thank you. And Sean, coming back to you again, um, being a smaller business, being part of someone's value chain may not always be easy. We've seen data from the SME Climate Hub, for example, that the biggest obstacle for smaller business to take action is lack of resources and lack of knowledge. So it's not easy. We're talking about here big businesses that are tackling this problem, but you know, they might have at least five or sometimes even thousands of people working with sustainability within the organization. Many suppliers do not have that. How can we help them? Yeah, absolutely. It's education is the key on this. So WWF published a report recently called Emission Possible, which was designed to help suppliers learn how to do this. We took it from the simplest approach. This is what you do. This is how you do it. This is the platform you should use. We need to be really clear with these people because small suppliers, as you say, they only have five or six staff, maybe that. Some of them, we had farmers who were being asked to input 40 pages of climate data. So we need to streamline what we're asking of them, simplify it down to a few core messages, core questions we need to get, and then hopefully unify our questions as well across brands so they're not getting different data requests from different people. But resources like Emission Possible, they're set up to do this. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin, coming back to you, what's the biggest pushback that you've heard from your value chain, the biggest obstacles that you found in terms of engaging them? In our case, we have had a great uh, collaboration from the start. We engaged with LKB in Vattenfall, started the hybrid initiative back in 2016, and we have run a significantly program of R&D, and we have come very far. And when we started, there were a lot of uh, skepticism from the industry. Many uh, companies who use steel were worried that this uh, product would be too expensive and so on. But we have uh, found uh, great companies like Volvo Group who have uh, used uh, the first phosphor steel we uh, delivered to them and uh, uh, built uh, big machines, uh, trucks, uh, construction machines that actually are running in southern Sweden, for example. They have delivered uh, now, just recently, trucks made uh, the frame from this fossil free steel uh, to uh, big companies like Amazon. Uh, so this value chain works. Uh, there are still uh, people that believe this is going to be too tough, but we are very convinced. 
we will find uh, uh, good collaborating partners and this uh, will be a business opportunity for all involved in the value chain. So, of course, um, a lot of work needs to be done, but technology is there. Uh, and coming back to the question regarding reporting, data, uh, accuracy, transparency, and so on, we believe it's extremely important because uh, now there is no common standard for what can be called uh, near zero emission steel. There are plenty of companies launching green steel uh, uh, branding uh, initiatives that are, uh, in many cases, very questionable. We are not uh, really working in that direction. We want to do the real change. We do the real uh, innovation and we take it with emissions. That is uh, all what we need to do because to save the climate, we can't do it uh, just only by showing figures. We need to take with emissions. We do it in this way and uh, she is doing another way. This is where it actually makes difference. Yes, we can't negotiate with climate. But just as in carbon accounting and carbon reporting, there is a lot of uh, greenwash fears in terms of doing it the wrong way, in terms of not getting the accuracy in the data, but also in the carbon offset space. How do you kind of help and guide uh, to make the more, like Christian was talking about, the more permanent, the more sustainable carbon uh, capture solutions? I think, I think this... It's okay, you can talk. I can talk. Okay, this is, uh, uh, this is a very relevant uh, topic you bring up. I think there are no framework today for uh, removal, which are a guiding principle worldwide, which actually sets the standard. Article 6, which will be usually debated uh, during COP27, I really hope that there will be a set of principles which actually can guide standards going forward so that we can all be call it aligned and understand that this is not uh, a way forward which are greenwashing. This is actually creating permanently removal of carbon, which is the heritage we have actually created during 150 years or, or more than that. So, so when, I, when I look at the challenges of actually creating removal as a standard in the world, we need to set the framework and Article 6, of course, is important there. The scope reduction, the scope 1, scope 2, scope 3, is, it's uh, crucially important. There will be a new release of the scope uh, this year and negative emissions will be included in scope 1. That's necessary. And then you can see, okay, the national framework and the national also regulation needs to be put in place. Today, for instance, it's not allowed to transport carbon dioxide in liquid form from Sweden to Norway and permanently store it. So this kind of also regulation needs to take be, be in place. And, but I'm really optimistic because five years ago we were not talking about this at all. Today we all know it's, it's totally necessary if we should reach the, the agreement going forward. Yes, thank you for clarifying that standardization also when it comes to carbon reporting is really key so we don't get the wild west out there when you cannot compare businesses' sustainability efforts. Um, Christian, is the path to net zero the same for all industries or are they very different depending on who you're representing? Um, I want to be brief because I believe that you wanted to follow up on the previous point here. Uh, but of course, it's different for uh, different industries. Uh, it all depends, you know, uh, on if you're, uh, I mean, it might be, steel might be a huge thing if you're a car manufacturer, for instance. Concrete will be a huge thing if you build uh, buildings. Uh, something that is common, though, for every single industry is that energy is always a huge thing. Uh, but I think, you know, other than that, there is not that many patterns. Like, most value chains are, are unique, and you need to really do the proper mapping and hotspotting to know where you will get the most bang for the buck and what uh, uh, suppliers to engage with to, to decarbonize as effectively as possible. I just wanted to follow up. We were talking about the fears of greenwashing, and it's just important. That's a very good thing that there's a fear of greenwashing. We need companies to be afraid of these nebulous claims they make that don't materialize to anything. 
this is the only way we've found to hold them to account. It's a social contract. So in the absence of government legislation, we can challenge brands in this. The best way to overcome it is to be good. Don't lie. Don't brag about something tiny when you've got something horrible happening over on the other side of the room. Just clarity, transparency, and not lying. It's the key. So. Thank you for that. And last year, Normative went at COP talking a lot about the involuntary greenwashing, that many businesses had the right intention to do well, but it ended up on bad data, bad reporting, and ended up not in the way the intentions were framed to be. But I think this year we can say we're past that. We have that knowledge. There is still a lot of good intention, but we know the work that has to be done. We know we cannot, you know, cheat with the accuracy. We need to have the full accounting in place in order for it to work. Uh, we have a little bit left of this session, so if there's any questions from the audience, then raise a hand and we will let you in. Yes, I'm coming down to you. Please state your name and the organization that you represent. Hello, everyone. My name is Ersin Ercan. Uh, I am working in uh, Turkish Standard Institution. Uh, I, would like to question, I would like to ask a question to Kristen. Uh, which standards do you use for carbon calculation? There are lots of standards, as you know. Uh, which standard do you prefer to carbon calculation? Uh, so uh, we, we use the greenhouse gas protocol standard and most other standards out there, regardless if it's CDP, uh, TCFD, uh, or the new disclosure regulations in the U, uh, uh, EU uh, refers to the greenhouse gas protocol standard. That being said, the greenhouse gas protocol standard have many flaws in the sense that it doesn't comp produce comparable results between legal entities. And that is quite crucial in order to create the right market incentives, right? So I mean, the only reason we have a financial market at all is because of that invention of double entry bookkeeping 600 years ago that I referred to before that enables investors to see the P&L of this company is comparable to the P&L of this company. So I have the right data to make you know, the right decisions. And we need the equivalent of carbon emissions. And there's a couple of initiatives out there that are trying to uh, address this. Uh, the Carbon Call, for instance, Pathfinder Initiative within the uh, you know, World Business Council of Sustainable Development. We work with those initiatives in many cases in order to push you know, something, push carbon accounting forward to be uh, finally comparable, because right now it isn't. Thank you for that, Christian. Any more questions from the audience? Anyone that would like to raise something? A silent audience. Well, I have more questions, so that is not a problem. Um, so we talked about the accuracy gap today, and you started with the commitment gap. Can you tell us, Christian, how does this all link together? How does it come together with commitments, accuracy, and action? Well, yeah, so that's a really good question. I mean, there is certainly a commitment gap today, uh, especially when it comes to the commitment of uh, governments. And again, we, ha we have to kind of be aware that uh, by design, the commitments, the net zero commitments of corporations are, are somewhat more ambitious because they take the scope three into account, which is not the default of you know, uh, governmental commitments. So that means that the commitment gap of uh, the corporate business world might not be that big because uh, because of some of the numbers that I showed that if everyone takes scope three uh, seriously uh, but uh, again what we want is action right now we have a huge action gap I mean we have tons of businesses that are committed to net zero uh, but you know committing is the easy part following through with the commitment on a year-to-year -year basis is the hard part and in order to do that you need accurate numbers you need accurate numbers to see okay am my carbon emissions, are they being reduced on a year-to-year -year basis? Because you can't negotiate with planets, we need to slash our emissions approximately in half by the, say, by the next decade. And uh, yeah, so I, I think that's how it all uh, fits together. You need, uh, we need a commitment gap to be filled, but we need the accuracy gap to be filled in, in, in order to uh, fill the action gap. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sean, coming on to you. Um, you worked with, well, you have a look at many businesses and have that kind of umbrella perspective as well. Um, what do you think 
is the biggest obstacle and opportunity here with closing the accuracy gap for small businesses? Increased revenue is the easiest thing I can say out loud to make people look up and pay attention. But if we've seen companies prioritizing contractors or who they're going to hire or who they're going to work with based on sustainability metrics now. So it's, it's in their interest to have clear and transparent data so people can see, okay, that looks good. We've also seen companies de-risk companies off their supply chain list because they weren't performing on sustainability metrics. So if they want to go forward, sustainability is the best thing they can do to kind of confirm that. Yes. I fully agree with that and especially seeing the wave that we have with companies that are doing the right type of sustainability work. If you don't, there is a high risk that you get left behind and lose out on those business opportunities. So the question is not if, but can you potentially survive without doing the right type of work. Um, moving to you, Martin. Um, so what is your key recommendation, having done all this work now, for those getting started now early in the journey? Where should they begin? Yes, uh, I completely agree with uh, Christian here regarding the gap uh, of uh, action. Uh, we need really to do the quick uh, action now because the climate can't wait. Uh, at SHAB, we have decided now within the coming eight years, take away 10% of Sweden's uh, CO2 emission, 7% of Finland's uh, CO2 emission. And we are going to move ahead with those investments because that is extremely important for, for ourselves, but also for our customers who are waiting to get this deal. We heard earlier from uh, Volvo Cars and uh, Polestar, for example. Uh, so for us, really, work with uh, uh, the, the, the difficulty we have today. Permit is a big issue for us, both in Sweden and Finland. We really need to run fast. We, here we need the engagement from the government, from the society, and from everybody involved so that we can quickly move ahead with the big investment program we launched. Second, standardization, important, because we need to have uh, credibility, what we talk about. Uh, green steel or ne near zero emissions, what it is. So we get credible trust uh, in the society. And then the, the uh, last but most important one is we need to create a level playing field in order for companies like us, who are front, run front runners, move first, are not punished because of uh, not uh, level playing field. And this is uh, a few of the key uh, preconditions that will enable a quick uh, transition. Thank you. And just adding to that, at Normative, when we work with our customers to close this accuracy gap, one good, very good example is, for example, MTC. When starting to use Normative, the accuracy gap wasn't 80%, like we're presenting on a slide. It was 400%. Emissions they just didn't know about or didn't capture in their calculations. And when you have that knowledge, you can start taking the right actions. You can identify the hotspot that makes the biggest difference for your business and engage them actively. So that is really, really crucial. And another example is, for example, flying Tiger that realized that you know one of their biggest emitters was actually due to the materials that they were using. So by actively working with it, swapping materials, they were able to reduce their emissions. And these success stories and also hearing how you're working and how everyone is engaging is such a great knowledge. But then again, Christian is saying that your value chain is unique. So until you've had that mapping done and identified what your unique case is, then you don't have the real knowledge to start acting on the accuracy. Closing up, let's end on a positive note. We uh, talked about the action gap. The good thing is we know it exists, which means we have the power to address it. So what is your final takeaway and what will you go away and do after this session? Maybe slightly differently or just the same? Starting, Sean. Well, a positive is for WWF, we have these talking points that we like to get out and try and influence people with. And throughout this panel, I've heard our guests actually kind of talk about them so I think it's time to change our talking points and get let's get pushier <laughs> I love it let's get pushier yes no. I mean uh, we, we need to have our first full-scale CO2 removal from bioenergy CO2 2026 in order to make that happen we need to push of course regulation we need to push simple regulation and we need to have the framework in Europe in place and that that is what we will actually continue with to, to uh, find a 
framework which actually allow others to follow us also. This, this is a need and we need to start now, we can't wait. That's my key message. Thank you. Moving to Martin next. Yes, we, we need to act now. Uh, we have this solution. Uh, we have shown this value chain works. We need to speed up the transition because uh, climate can't wait. And Christian? Um, right now, the main question that is being asked, are you committed to net zero or not? We need to change that question. Are you on your pathway to net zero or not? Uh, and something that we launched uh, uh, just recently is a net zero score that will be able to track if businesses are actually taking prog making progress on a year-to-year -year basis towards net zero. So, so I would also like to invite everyone that is interested to participate in that process. It has been an open process with our partners uh, from UN Race to Zero campaign, such as Exponential Roadmap Initiative, uh, uh, Oxford Net Zero, and so on. So uh, if, if you want to shape that uh, next step, which is not just commitments, but, but actions, uh, we are happy to have a conversation. Thank you for that. So I'd like to thank our digital panel that we had with us today, our physical panel, the businesses that made this discussion possible, SSRB, Volvo Cars, Polestar, WWF, Stockholm Exergy, and Right Economy. It's been a pleasure at Normative to host this discussion. If you have any questions, you find us here at COP or reach out to us. We'd be happy to engage in the discussion. So with that, thank you, audience, and I wish you all a fantastic rest of the day.
Good afternoon. Perfect. Good afternoon one more time. Dear participants who are here physically with us and those who are digital attendees of the event, welcome to our session. And I would like to start it with introducing the panelists. Um, please welcome Ms. Hannah Gran, Sustainability Leader representing Spotify today and uh, my colleagues from Stockholm Plus 50 Eustace Force, Yoko Lu from Japan and Canada, and Alphonse Moindi from uh, Kenya. Together with me, Diana Garlitska, uh, who represented, who represent Eustace um, Force Plus 50, um, dedicated to Stockholm conference that happened earlier this year in June. Um, us here, went through a long process of negotiations, work, and um, intense collaboration with youth globally to work and deliver a um, substantial amount of documents, in fact, that reflected on the position of young people that um, addressed governments and businesses, speaking of their expectations and uh, hopes for the future that is inclusive and just, and also considers concerns for the environment. In this session today, we are to reflect on the legacy of uh, Stockholm Plus 50, the work of Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force, and discuss how young people use globally can collaborate with businesses. And we welcome you all to also take part actively in the uh, Q&A session at the end of this discussion. Well, um, to start the discussion part of, of our experience really within the um, Stockholm Plus 50 and, and on the road of preparing to it. I would like to maybe address my colleagues in the first place, asking among the issues reflected in the global use policy paper, what are the main issues you would like not only the government but also the business focus on during the COP and beyond? Okay, thank, thank you so much, uh, my, my colleague Dan, uh, for, for setting the stage and uh, for having us uh, th this time to talk about the legacy of Stockholm Plus 50 and uh, especially looking from the lenses of young people. Well, I, I think uh, in Stockholm it was the first time for young people to be mobilized and uh, come up with a very comprehensive document bearing demands of young people. Uh, from all over the planet to, to leaders. And uh, I looked at it, uh, I mean, I looked at some statistics uh, afterwards and found that 51% that, that, uh, of the attendees of uh, Stockholm Plus 50 International Meeting were actually young people. So that, 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 that tells you how it turned out to be actually a conference, a youthful conference, so to say. But uh, now talking about 50 years of environmental multilateralism, is where we want to be looking forward. Effective multilateralism uh, really needs young people. And then coming back to the question of uh, the demands, uh, I'm not sure if I'm audible enough, <laughs> but um, the, we, we developed a, a global uh, youth policy paper uh, around the three thematics of uh, the international meeting. First looking on the actions that are urgently needed for us to transition to a climate resilient future. Second one, uh, you know, like reflecting on how best to leapfrog from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then the third one on how best we can uh, implement the environmental dimension of sustainable developments. And uh, there were some comprehensive demands in the, in the three topics. Um, one of them we pushed for creation of, of a UN youth office. And we are happy that through the advocacy that we ran in Stockholm, we actually have it, you know. Uh, United Nations General Assembly adopted creation of, of a UN Youth Office. That's a plus. And then another thing <laughs> that, that we are very happy about is that recognition of, um, you know, a right for healthy, clean, and sustainable development as a, a, a right for everyone, you know, as a human right. And that was also adopted in UNGA. <laughs> Uh, given the, the level of, of advocacy that we ran in, in Stockholm. And uh, going forward on, on how we need to do it, especially with the business uh, side of things, 
we need to ensure that we create more jobs for young people. Uh, and now, especially now talking from the perspective of Kenya, uh, we took the model of Kenyan youth uh, with the Swedish youth coming in as the co-hosts of, uh, of the youth assembly, just like the Kenyan government and Swedish government were coming in as the, the co-hosts of this international meeting. So back at, uh, in Kenya right now, we are coming up with what we are calling Stockholm Plus 50 legacy projects, youth le legacy projects. And these are geared towards creating green jobs for young people uh, that are actually like climate resilient. There are so many opportunities and as Stockholm Plus 50 was actually an opportunity and our responsibility. So I think this is the, it was a wake up call and we are still uh, trying to implement the 10 point outcome that came from there. And the last outcome actually was uh, on taking through the outcomes to COP15 of biodiversity, COP27 of climate, going through to, to the summit of the future and uh, SDG summit that are coming along. So it, Stockholm Plus 50 was not actually an event. It was a process and the process also lives on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alphonse. So my name is Yoko. So, so my name is Yokoru. So I am like from Canada or Japan, but I actually grew up in China. So, so for, for the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth as Post Policy Paper, we we were talking about like all the sectors alone, and that as Alphonse has mentioned, that everything like is really important. Actually, I have. Uh, talk at the Swedish Pavilion before, so I've actually retouched my some points uh, earlier, like yesterday. So I would like to also like focus on the business part. That business part hasn't really been mentioned across all the conferences and also like in the youth world because we're having all like students. We haven't really think about the business world, so it's also very important to really diverge, like indulge into the business world and have a youth perspective and have how the business world, the business leaders can really think about how this youth can really incorporate into the business, also just, just transition and human rights, and also the green jobs, that the green jobs was something that was a topic that was mentioned in COP26, and because of that, Okay, I'm actually speaking of a different group right now. So because of that, like Yanko, for example, created a green jobs working group based on the recommendation from COP26. So this is also a really nice way to say that attending these conferences as youth, it can also bring more opportunities for the future. And so within the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth has a uh, first policy paper. We also like touch upon the, uh, the aspiration for future. We we also talk about how uh, we really can engage in the future and really think about future generations so that no one can leave behind. And also, okay, I'm actually going to touch on different multiple dimensions. Um, so from health perspective, also like one health is very really important because health is not just about mental health or like the, the general hospitals, but it's all about health also in, in nature. It's not just about humans, but it's really everything's connected. So yesterday at the youth pavilion, there was this uh, assignment on the health that we were introducing about the youth forum of adolescents that 1.5, uh, 1.8 billion children were part of it. 1.8 million, sorry, a billion, I think. And then, and then so. Yeah, so our policy paper really sh show off at Stockholm Plus 50. It's not just about Stockholm Plus 50, but it's also beyond that we can bring this policy paper to the COP27, for example, and really integrate into other youth perspectives and statements and really push forward and bring the three themes of the Stockholm Plus 50 beyond and really adjust all this all into SDGs and also other UN conferences, for example. And I, I, I think I have really touched this in a really broad way. And also like, also like this nature of biodiversity, energy. Like even though we don't think they're like part of us one because they all seem to be really separate. But, but actually, like for example, nature-based solutions can be also 
into energy. It's not just nature, but everything can be connected. So that's something that we want to bring on about the systematic thinking and systematic connections. Thank you very much. Indeed, um, when having here um, representatives of Swedish business and maybe some governmental officials, um, considering we now have an opportunity to really speak directly with businesses, what would be your message to the business on collaboration with, with youth? Th th thank you uh, for, for bringing this up. I think young people out there really need to, I mean, look at things from the business angle, things that can can help them, can help their communities, can help uh, uh, you know the, the planet. You know, we are talking of green solutions, and um, uh, now speaking directly and addressing the business community, I think. There is a lot of opportunity coming from Stockholm Plus 50. Like in Kenya, for example, we've been working very closely with the, with the government of Kenya to domesticate these outcomes that came from Stockholm uh, in, our, in our country. And uh, young people are actually at the center of this. We've done like two rounds of intense consultations. Uh, one, uh, the first one was focusing the opportunities in solid waste management uh, within the country for young people to take up, uh, create jobs for themselves and, and, and for, for you know, other people. Uh, we had a, a second round of intense consultations talking about how best we can use the opportunities in the forestry sector. Like Kenya right now, there is a very ambitious plan to uh, like increase the forestry cover from around 10% where we are right now to 30% uh, in the next decade, you know. And this is now a, a climate, uh, is creation of climate resilience, but it's as well uh, an opportunity, a business opportunity, you know, creation of, of green opportunities. We are talking of uh, doing things like uh, dry land value chains, because when you talk about land restoration just people think about greening and, and all that narrative but there, there is also potential in these dryland areas people can create uh, value chains of dryland uh, maybe non-timber forest products and push them to the market plow back the, the revenue to the communities and in that way you'll have addressed so many things as a domino effect you know so if young people already have so many ideas and right now in back in Kenya we're trying to map them and in the context of Stockholm plus 50 you know like to have these as legacy projects to map these ideas that young people are having and then see how best we can work with the people in the business world in terms of of uh, pushing the products you know the, the tangible products back to the market but also like uh, getting to invest in these uh, ideas of young people that are going to help us leapfrog this, you know, the dirty phase of development, if I may call it that way. And uh, if a lot is invested in this, we can achieve so many things. We keep on talking about young people being at the center of policy development, but we also need young people at the center of implementation of these things that, uh, these policies that we formulate. And that is what is going to make a difference. We may have so many good things on paper, but if that is not translated to reality on the ground, then I don't think there's progress there. So uh, that is talking from what we are already working on. And I think young people are already doing their part. So I call the business sector, the government and the leaders to come in and support young people. Young people are already doing their part. They just need enabling environment, support in terms of resources, capacity development, and then there we are. Thank you so much. So I will speak from a different perspective. So, am I? Ah. So, so, so I will think about uh, from different perspectives. So I recently touched upon this business transformation. That so will be really interesting to have that 
business transformation that to be really like changing in a way that will be unique in the long term. It's not like traditional. For example, like in a traditional world, I would say that like there is like people working, but there's not really meaningful engagement within the business. And also perhaps like there's also like different cultural perspective. Like, for example, I have worked in both um, global uh, in different countries. That for example, like in um, in Japan, I work in both international and uh, national com com companies. So in national companies, we were very more commercial, uh, more traditional. So Japanese, like we have just these meetings, have this Japanese culture. Like we uh, go to like different dinners each day because that is a traditional to have a new in new employees coming by, and we have these welcome dinners introduced. But after that, it's just regular work. But in this international company in Japan, it was, it was really different. Like we they they were, so I was there as a project based. So th and then they were really including us, even though we are like the temporary. They really included us in our in their like weekly meetings where we also talk about the health and safety, environmental safety de de department. <coughs> uh, because I was working the, uh, like involved in that department, the HSES, and they don't only include people from HSES, but they also include. Like people, okay, this is engineering com company. Uh, it was actually more like a renewable energy company that where people, were, everyone was included in their meetings, even though, even with the like computer people, with ladies, computer science people, like not related. So it was really nice experience in Japan that I was exposed to this international Japanese company environment that was really productive and it was, I feel like, I feel like to be meaningful to work in a company. So, I mean, that is kind of like in an international uh, perspective. And it's really, so I think it would be, it'd be really nice to see that these traditional countries or traditional government, um, like I'm not really saying about Japan, but traditional, <laughs> traditional government, that really they should really move forward to include everyone and make it really different so that everyone is included and become more internationalized. And we as a business transformation, I also meant to include more, more like human rights or just transition or like green jobs, have more like policy side or the UMCCC where these employees can also learn more about this high level policy makings and also to have them really think about how the company affects its people and how its people also are influenced by, positively influenced by the company, so they have a positive impact on the company. And also, I really have like this capacity building and how to really have this pe like these employees to really have like be part of this community where they can be part of this business. Um, yeah, and also it's really nice also to include like again, the youth and everyone to have a business transformation. And that's kind of my main point here. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, collaboration and communication really is a two-way process and it takes more than just one party. And it's amazing to have Anna here with us to have a perspective of business. And while I address a question to Anna now, um, I also invite all the business participants here to consider how they would reflect on it and maybe to use the time during the comments and Q&A to share your perspective. So Hannah, as a representative of Spotify, how can your organization collaborate with you to strengthen access to information and participation on climate change issues and other human, human rights? I mean, first of all, it's vital that we do it. So thank you for all the work you're doing, especially also when you talked about how much has actually been implemented since Stockholm Plus 50. It's not that long ago. So it really shows that putting youth at the center means fast action and real action. So really happy to hear that. And uh, for us, it comes down to, I mean, listening to the youth perspective, that's the future perspective. So if we want to have a long-term business, I think all businesses need to, to take that into account because you're the ones that are going to drive the companies going forward and also have that long-time view. So 
what we have tried to do at least internally and, and also when you mentioned their business transformation how important it is you also mentioned some examples uh, in terms of really making sure that everyone is part of this and not just a separate meeting so what we have is um, we have created a climate champion network internally so we're a rather small sustainability team and that's the la way we like to have it because it's ultimately everyone's work that this agenda uh, is made real and, and, and that also takes action and in a fast way. So what we have, we have champions across the companies, everything from R&D that are focusing on, okay, can we actually make the app smarter so it requires less electricity? But it's everything else also. Um, and by doing that, creating small hubs, we also bring in more people and also younger people to the conversation. So it's not only made in, in certain settings and so on, but that everyone feel that they can contribute both with ideas and actual um, spend time on it as part of their daily work. So we have many people that have this like an extra hat on, which is climate then uh, as part of their daily work. So that's a little bit how we have tried to internalize the transformation aspect that you're talking about um, inside Spotify. Thank you. Um, maybe I would like to ask all the participants here have their reflection and thoughts on using the existing platforms that we have and maybe consider new platforms. Um, what could be those platforms and way of communicating, uh, communication on engaging young people in a meaningful, truly um, inclusive way in decision making? Thank you so much, uh, Diana, for driving this discussion in a very nice way. I, I, I think um, talking about um, communication especially and uh, getting information out, out there is very important. And most of the young people are actually left out because of lack of information. People may think that uh, uh, financial resources may be the, the only problem. Actually not. If you empower people with information, then it will be so easy to, to make inroads um, in these things that people find very challenging. And um, uh, addressing that, I'd also try to talk about the efforts that we've done in Kenya uh, after Stockholm. It's a lot that we, we are trying to do, <laughs> uh, like uh, as part of legacy of Stockholm uh, plus fifth international meeting. When are you resting? I just wonder. Oh, well, uh, I, I, th I don't think we've rested from Stockholm. <laughs> yeah, and um, we are working closely with the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, the Africa Regional Office, we are lucky that is actually based in Nairobi, to develop uh, a report that is a bit, you know, centric to the Kenyan context, uh, talking about how Kenyan youth engage the whole process, and looking forward now, how young people can lead domesticating these uh, outcomes of Stockholm Plus 50, but also trying to uh, create the next half century, I mean, uh, the next half century uh, team of uh, young people who are very engaged in environmental multilateralism in some way, but also those who are leading climate actions on the ground. And uh, we are developing this report. Uh, right now we have like a, a first edition of it. We are trying to refine it and soon it will be published in the website of Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, that will show how, you know, young people in Kenya are taking forth uh, outcomes of, of Stockholm Plus 50 uh, down to the grassroots, but also following up in the, you know, in making multilateral system to work. Because uh, for a long time, well, we have landmark years uh, that shows us actually multilateral system can work. A few days I saw some people making jokes in... Uh, in social media showing a photo, the high level photo that was taken out of this COP27 during the World Leaders Summit. Then it showed so many men, you know, like uh, I don't think there was a woman there, uh, maybe one or two. And then someone was saying, look, I think it's time now we, we, we ask help from women because men uh, seems to be a bit fail <laughs> fa failing uh, us going forward. Well, but uh, what I'm trying to say here is that we need to 
uh, ensure that information gets down to people, and that's why your role is quite quite important. We have to ensure that uh, we also speak to, to people in a language they understand. For example, uh, from, from Kenya where I come from, climate change doesn't have uh, a name in my local dialect, you know. Uh, the, they don't, you know, I, I don't kind of get a word, one word in my vernacular that can be translated directly to climate change. It will be a whole sentence trying to describe or something like that. But going there, if I tell these people drought, Kenya right now is facing the worst drought in 40 years, for example. We are seeing so many, uh, you know, loss of lives, livelihoods, and things like those. And then I hope Diana will talk a little bit about how we expect out of, uh, out of this COP, for example. Because we have to sow seeds of common uh, prosperity. And that is what we are talking about in, in Stockholm. We can't be sowing seeds of common uh, destruction. And... Uh, Talking of loss and damage, for example, that, that is a topic that concerns everyone because it's just a matter of time and uh, impacts of this crisis will be at the nook and cranny of every part of the planet. So, in, in short, information, 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 and then after empowering young people, let it not just end there. Give them the means to use that power. Just don't empower them. And then after, uh, don't, don't give them information and you leave at it at that. They'll be so much informed, but they are not empowered, you know. Give them power to use that information and to impact more people, impact uh, businesses, transform the world, you know. So I think those, those could be my initial ideas in terms of how young people need to be, uh, you know, empowered in terms of, getting information, requisite information. Young people now are connected than any other time in history of humanity. We have social media that connects us every time and uh, that we should use that power. We keep talking about the power in youth. That is part of the power that we need to make use of. Thank you so much. So, hello. So, I'm just checking the mic. So, I will also give a, a specific example. So, I'm part of the Global Youth Climate Change with the um, Service Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Korea. And the 2050 Carbon Neutrality Green Growth Commission in Korea. So this Global Youth Climate Change is like really new, it's like three year old. And it's, it's, like it's assisted by the government in Korea. And so they actually had a decision yesterday where I was part of, of and Ban Ki Moon is a part of this, uh, this program. And so with global youth climate change, although it is supported by the government of Korea, they don't just want to include the Korean national youth, but they also want to include international youth. So for example, this year is the third year. So for this year, we have like six different working groups that are from different regions of the world. And my section, so my group, is actually reforestation for Eastern Asia and North America. And we, fo we focus on deforestation. So our project is to really mapping out how we want to engage with private, co private corporate like business for our, our top topic. So we came up with this mapping where we had this mapping with the deforestation map using like open source data from, from NOAA, for example, this example. And then we were planning to use this map to showcase how the deforestation has affected our regions. And we also want to make a website that we had to want to have a pledge on a business, and on one business, one major business, international business like Coca-Cola or Microsoft, those that have reforestation projects across the world, and how we really want to carry this, how the deforestation and business are collected, and we want to carry this forward to the P4G summit in Colombia next year in 2023. And there is so the GYCC, the team will also be like here. Like yesterday, they played the Korean pavilion, and so 
so they have the colleges and they have this um, the ministry of the IT, the technology here to support this project. And so, so after our presentation yesterday, for example, there is this um, the Egyptian uh, hackathon team came to actually meet us to really talk about how the Egyptian team can also team up with this global youth climate change. And they re they really want to talk about how like they also had this like different they had like six different themes including waste, energy, technology, and like water and some others in Egypt. And they really want to like, incorporate into this Ministry of Korea this project because I believe this is the first project within the member states that has a project for youth that includes youth across the world. And because it's new, I think it's a really good starting point like, um, that is assisted or managed by the government with the help of the youth leaders and ministry across the world. Yoko, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Please, Hannah, go ahead and yeah, for us yeah. to have some minutes for Q&A. Okay, I'll be quick. So I think, of course, I, I spoke a little bit before what we do in our own organization, but to your point, we, you know, with information and platforms, the most important thing is, of course, what we do with our platform. Uh, because I'm very biased, but I really think that music and audio and podcasts can be that source of information and also open up so that you hear more perspectives to this question and also hear what's going on more across the world as well. So that's really a focus area for us. Everything from creating climate science fiction about this to make people interested in the first place, but also lifting up young voices. So that's one part why we are here at COP actually, to have more a pop-up podcast to be able to tell people that are not able to be here what's going on, what is this, and the importance of actually addressing this in, in different dimensions. So that's a huge part of what we do. We did, for example, earlier this year, we highlighted voices, young voices from mar marginalized groups, just because so that people that are not on Greenland can understand the climate changes that is going on there. So a lot of that is what we're doing. So we really try to use our platform for that. But any ideas you have on what we can do more, let me know. Perfect. Thank you so much. And indeed, for the rest of the time that we have, it will be great to have some comments, reflections, questions from the audience. And we welcome this time to use for that. Please, go ahead. Hello. So, um, in an attempt to try to um, uh, inculcate youth into green business ideologies, what are some of the mediums that you think can help push, uh, push youth in um, green business ideas? Well, let, let me let me try to to answer. Uh, if Very it brief. will not be sufficient, you can uh, also let me know. Um, but yeah, I think uh, for me, young people need platforms to showcase uh, things they are doing in small scale, and, and that uh, we have. We must be honest that uh, there's a huge gap in that because. Young people, especially those who are on the front lines, doing amazing job, never get to have opportunities to access these platforms to showcase the good work they're doing. So whatever good thing they're doing, it just remains there being a small scale thing. Uh, they really struggle around. Most of them give up in the process. But if we can have uh, platforms for young people to do exhibitions on uh, this, these things, the, the, the small uh, businesses they are, they are running, the green uh, business ideas, or rather, let me talk about uh, the green businesses that are in existence. Uh, it becomes a problem for them to get that platform. And that's one of the surest ways for them to scale up, for, the, for it to become a big thing that can employ more young people, that can you know, make even more impact. So one of my proposals actually is to ensure that when uh, we have opportunities, those young people doing amazing works, 
in the very grassroots level are considered to be given platforms for them to be exposed in the first place, for them to showcase whatever they are doing. And then the second thing is that there is a lot of uh, like indifference or rather apathy to ideas of young people. Sorry to say that, but it's, it's, it's the truth. I mean, if you have a brilliant idea, you, can, you are taken through a very long process of writing concepts, proposals. You can even submit a whole dossier. You know, a very, you know, you're taken through a, an extreme process of paperwork to be given, you know, like few dollars. Can we make this accessible? Because the finances are there, by the way, but they are not accessible. Thank you Even so for, for these uh, uh, green climate finances and things like those, they are there. But you'll be surprised to hear government uh, focal points telling you that we keep on returning this money in the end of fiscal year because we've not expended, you know? Why? The money is not accessible to young people, basically. So how can we make uh, accessibility, how can we break these accessibility barriers? How can we make, uh, make it possible for small and medium enterprises access uh, money that is in place. I think that that is a question now that I throw it back and uh, we can hear some comments around that. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah, would you like to reflect as well? Um, I think I mentioned a little bit before that I, I fully that our platform can be one of those sources where, where people can express opinions and, and also uh, reach and hear more stories and more perspectives because currently we're speaking a lot in silos, both when it comes to age and background and where you are in the world. So hopefully it can break down some silos in that aspect. Unfortunately, our session is coming to an end and I would like to also use the time to wrap up the discussions that were taking place today. It's indeed a great success of the work that was happening in preparation to the Stockholm Plus 50 conference during it and even afterwards when um, a group of youth task force dedicated to Stockholm Plus 50. It's not only the three of us on the stage, it's some of the colleagues present here today and even more of us in all the pavilions and um, throughout the, the zones uh, created to COP27. Uh, uh, the youth globally that was part of youth task force and also those who took part actively in consultations have dedicated themselves hours and hours of work to creating those documents, specifically policy paper and in fact other do documents created within youth task force that really have put in paper and communicated very vividly the expectations of young people towards governments and business and we're happy indeed like Alphonse mentioned that some of the points were already implemented we can see the creation of your youth office we can see that um, the right for natural environment healthy natural environment is considered to be um, documented as basic human right and that is a great achievement but there are still many points from the policy paper that we expect to be implemented that are on the table and we look up to the governments and businesses to really take active role in to following up on other things on the list indeed and um, in the discussions before the sessions informally we were talking about different cops that took place before and how cop 27 is happening and that um, some of the participants were having an issue reaching out to young people, finding them. And in fact, this COP27 is the first one where there is a dedicated children and youth pavilion. And I think maybe that is a one way to find young people. If you're interested in collaborating with them, if you want to establish a contact, have their feedback, hear their thoughts, um, to also use this time to meet not only with other business representatives, potential partners, but also young people and have their ideas um, really live streamed to you right here at the spot. They have much to say. We have enormous, in fact, experience working those extra hours, often unpaid, for the sake of the idea of bringing, utilizing all the potential of the youth organizations that we represent and um, trust there is much that youth can do jointly with business. We welcome you to meet us all there and thank you for being part of this session. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Beverly Cornaby. I am from the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Welcome to this session on the role of digitalization in the transition to net zero. I'm delighted today to moderate this panel, which we have uh, four speakers joining us, where we're going to go through some of the enablers, some of the opportunity, but also some of the challenges in terms of, you know, how do we, the role of digitalization in net zero and what it can do. So I'm going to welcome up here Anna Selzing from Alpha Lavelle, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer, Matt Sharp, Head of Sustainability at Ericsson, and Christian Ron, uh, who is CEO of Normative. We also have online, who should be joining us, is Christopher Laurel, who is Senior VP Research and Public Affairs at Enride, who hopefully should be appearing online. Thank you. There he is, fantastic. So we're going to go straight into the questions. I would like to ask our panelists, obviously, as you start answering the first question that I put to you, please, can you introduce yourself and just say a little bit about your organization as well in terms of what you're doing on Net Zero? So the first question we're going to go into is, why is digitalization an enabler, an accelerator for Net Zero? And I'm going to go to Matt at Ericsson. Thank you. So Matt Pedersen from Ericsson. Uh, Ericsson provides the infrastructure for all digitalization, so mobile networks. Uh, so I think we, we are a fundamental part of digitalization for most companies in the world. And why is digitalization important? I would sort of try to turn it around. If we don't use digitalization and, uh, in the right way, I would say, because it's also important to do the right type of digitalization. If we don't use it the right way, we can never make uh, the whole thing by 2030. We really have to do that uh, soon and we have to start now. And I think there are sort of two different aspects of digitalization. Part of what we will talk about today is sort of the cool stuff, the innovations, the new things, the what 5G, AI uh, and all of these things can do. And there is massive opportunities in that area and, and we can use it in a, in a really good way. Uh, but that will not come now. That will take some time to evolve. But I think that's important. It is to remember that already the existing solutions that we have, if we use them and scale them, we can sort of reach the first 15%. And we need to do that now. We need to use digitalization and the existing solutions uh, and break the curve. Because, I mean, there are lots of things that need to happen. But just one quick example to make it more tangible, maybe. If we sort of, when we talk about buildings, uh, the buildings, uh, we talk a lot about changing the heating system, retrofitting, uh, new windows, new insulation. That costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time. But if we just control the systems that are there, the ventilation, the heating systems, with better digital solutions, we can save 15% already now. And that goes much faster. And that will buy us time to do the retrofitting and changing everything else. So I think that is sort of the two step of digitalization. Thank you. I mean, you speak there around some of the kind of the sector specific, you know, needs there, particularly built environment. I mean, Anna, I'm going to come to you first in terms of can you elaborate on how digitalization role in your particular industry? Yes. And I represent Alpha Laval, oh, who are oh, technology oh. leaders uh, in the three core technologies, I would say heat transfer and separation and fluid handling. It's very much those processes behind the scenes that we rely on every day, like food, water, and energy. And uh, to us, I think it's the same as Matt said, there are two sides to it, both that we really, as we are committed to net zero, carbon neutral by 2030, we need to drive uh, our scopes down, our carbon emissions, and to do that, we need uh, to, to optimize, uh, we need a digital, tools to optimize, not the least, our customers' processes. For example, the very easy one, like you say, using what's already there, remote guidance, not sending out a field service engineer, for example, uh, but be there 24-7, that makes a huge difference. And we can also do lots by IoT solutions, infrared cameras, etc. So bringing down that scope here and now, and on the other side, as we are committed again to net zero, we need to also show and be transparent in our data, collect the data from our suppliers, which is a great complexity. 
uh, and we need the data also to prevent the greenwashing, I would say. Uh, so those are the two sides that I see uh, yeah. for our part. So in a minute, we'll come back on to the role of data, but I just want to give a chance for Christopher to come in as well and introduce yourself and also kind of answer the same question in terms of the di digitalization's role in your industry. Good afternoon from Stockholm and thanks uh, Beverly for, for having us. Uh, my name is Christopher and I work for Enride and what we do is to uh, connect, electrify and also implement autonomous solutions. And digitalization is one of the most powerful technology shifts that we have seen in, uh, in the, the history of uh, humankind. Because what it does is that it provides an opportunity to utilize underutilized resources. Uh, and what we are seeing in the transport sector is that uh, there is much to be done when it comes to uh, um, getting these productivity increases that we have seen throughout a number of sectors where we have seen a lot of digitalization initiatives being taken. Just to uh, give you one example, the average fill rate of, um, of a truck is around 50% at the moment. And that has very much to do with the fact that optimization is done on truck level instead of uh, on a system level. What we do at Enride is to uh, connect trucks with one another, fleets with one another. And by doing that, we can optimize a transport system where we go from a productivity and fill rate level that is uh, simply too low to uh, instead uh, become uh, much greater. And in doing that, we can actually reduce the number of trucks on the roads while delivering the same capacity. So that is one illustration of uh, the role that digitalization plays. Uh, it, it's a powerful tool to um, get the most out of the resources that we are commercially deploying and that have uh, been the case in a lot of different sectors. Now at Enride we are doing the same thing when it comes to road transport. Thank you and you mentioned there some of the enablers as well and you know we are going to need enablers to drive up digitalization and to look at it and it's going to be different across different size companies, different size value chains and I think you mentioned there about actually the role of innovation and supply chains. So Kristen, I want to come on to you in terms of actually, you know, what are the enablers to scale up digitalization? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Wow, what an effect. I'm coming in with a bang. So uh, my name is Christian, uh, CEO and co-founder of Normative. We do carbon emissions accounting for enterprises. That means that we help them uh, calculate and, and manage their carbon footprint in, in their operations and uh, in the value chain. And back to the question on enablers of digitization and why digitization is needed in the first place. I mean, whenever you have a topic that fulfills certain criteria, it, it, digitization is needed. And so whenever you have a topic where there's a high degree of management, you know, managing some sort of performance, when there's a high degree of collaboration and communication, you need digitization. So it happened to CRMs, it happened to financial systems, and it will happen to the whole process of net zero because it fulfills all of those criteria. We have complex value chains where several actors need to work together on their decarbonization. Uh, so you have the element of collaboration, you need to communicate to do so, and you also need to manage performance. I mean, are we going towards net zero fast enough? So I mean, of course we need uh, digitization for net zero. It is uh, absolutely critical, and it is the, uh, you know, it's one of the slogans here on the stage. It's one of the biggest uh, collabs in human history. So, uh, yeah, of course we need it. Brilliant. I'm going to just come back to you because you mentioned about value chains, and one of the things that, you know, we've, and also it's been mentioned about data, but in relation to particularly smaller businesses and actually how, you know, we work with them and how as bigger companies you work with them. I don't know if you can pick up a bit more on actually the kind of how you can become data partners to be able to support them, to be able to support yourself in terms of particularly, you know, looking at addressing scope through emissions. That's absolutely a brilliant question. Uh, and as I said a few times before on this conference, we 
have governments that are negotiating net zero targets, putting forth net zero targets, there is a huge gap. But in the end of the day, it's companies within the jurisdictions of those governments that needs to reduce their carbon emissions. And on planet Earth, there exists around 400 million companies. Almost all of those companies are SMEs. Uh, but the thing is that if you look at the interconnectedness you have around 1,000 large enterprises that are probably responsible for around 80% uh, of global emissions due to that interconnectedness. So these large enterprises have long value chains of smaller enterprises that they need to work with. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we at Normative, together with our partners at the We Mean Business Coalition and the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, started something that we call the SME Climate Hub. And the whole goal is to essentially empower SMEs to take climate action. Uh, because you have this, you, every one of these, you know, for, or most of those companies need to, to take climate action in order for, you know, large enterprises such as yourself should, you know, accomplish your, your net zero uh, targets. Uh, and we did a survey that the most common reason that uh, smaller businesses don't take climate action is because they think it's going to be super expensive, uh, it's going to cost uh, a lot of time, uh, and I think what we have done at Normative and, and with the SME Climate Hub is that we have proven that this is not the case. So we have actually enabled thousands of companies to set the net zero targets, calculate their carbon emissions, uh, and, and you know, essentially uh, reduce. Uh, so I don't know if that was an answer to your question to begin with. <laughs> That's right. I think it is a bit of an answer. I'm going to come on though. Actually, I'm going to come on to you, Mats, because I know you're part of the supply chain initiative that is within the SME Climate Hub. That is one way that's looking to actually, you know, how do larger businesses work with their SME, you know, their kind of supply chains, but specifically with SMEs to support them in terms of their decarbonization journey. So I was just wondering whether there was any experience that you can bring, can bring for that, but specifically thinking about this point of digitalization and how, you know, on your own decarbonization journey, but also theirs as well, you know, how you collaborate. As Ericsson was sort of one of the founders of, of, of the initiative, I think already when we did the first exponential uh, roadmap report back in 2018, uh, we said that we are preaching to the choir. We are at these conferences going around. And it's always the same 200 companies that come to the same conferences and talk to each other. They are part of Women Business, they are part of World Economic Forum, they are part of World Business Council for Sustainable Development and, and a lot of other groups. And it's the same. And we said, this doesn't sort of break it. We really need to get everybody else moving. Uh, and, and based on that, we said, we can put requirements on suppliers. But learning from the history of working with uh, supplier code of conduct and working conditions, if they don't understand or cannot make it, there is no chance uh, that they can meet these requirements. They will say yes, but they cannot do anything about it. So that was sort of the starting point of, of the supply chain leaders and why we said we need, a, we need a guide for companies, we need a simple tool for companies, we need to work together to put the same requirements so, so they hear it from different companies, so we need industries and clusters to work together. So that was really the starting point for, for, for this. And I, I'm super happy that sort of the SME Climate Hub is there. We have the, the normative tool, we have uh, the 1.5 uh, degree playbook to help them with the guideline. We have the supplier engagement guide to help c big companies work with their own uh, sourcing departments and procurement departments to help them work with the suppliers. So I think that is really a fantastic tool. And looking at it from a digitalization perspective, we could never do it face to face. We have 24,000 suppliers at Ericsson. We know the 150 that emits 90% of our supply chain emissions. And we can work with them, 150 companies. We cannot work with the 24,180 through 250 other companies. My math is going. So, uh, so it's, it's really, uh, then we need the digital tools. So we need the SME Climate Hub, where we can sort of gather these tools and, and gather the, the guidelines and helps. So we can sort of work in a digital way with suppliers and have an engagement that we don't need us to meet and, and talk to all of them. So I think that's the only way to reach. And I think that goes across several areas that when you need to scale something big, then 
digital tools are the only way to do it. Brilliant. And Anna, if you can please come in, particularly around, you know, I mean, Matt's mentioned some of the tools that obviously via the SME Climate Hub, but I don't know how you're using tools and data in terms of, yeah, engaging. Yeah, I, to... I can just agree with Matt that that's exactly, we're very thankful that it, that is uh, started by you and others. Uh, we need the same, so we try to go with the same standards as everybody else, not making our own up because it's tricky as it is for all the SMEs. If, and that, that's what I see. Uh, many of our large companies also sending around requests for data from both from us and other SME or SMEs, uh, which makes it very burdensome uh, and very hard to collect the data and the data quality is very poor often. So we very much need to get together and decide on using the same tools and standards as everybody else. Fantastic. Um Christopher, I want to bring in you as well, because obviously thinking about the transport sector, I mean, there's a lot that is needed in terms of the transition. So I was wondering whether you've got examples of where you're working with partnerships, particularly in your supply chains, to actually deliver and to be able to um, support you know, decarbonisation. We, uh, we have talked quite a lot um, during this panel, uh, and uh, there, there is one thing that uh, is worth, uh, worth adding to, uh, to this, the discussion that we have had. Because usually we have had one technology shift taking place at the time. But um, in contemporary society, it looks very different. It's not only digitalization that is one of the major technology shifts. We also have electrification, 5G, and autonomous technologies. And if there is one thing uh, that uh, we are seeing from, from our perspective, is that the solutions of tomorrow that will really, really have an impact on the levels of emissions that we are seeing across the world right now is solutions that are coming out of the crossroads between these technology shifts. We at Android, just like many actors out there, believe that partnership is the new leadership. And that is also one of the reasons for why we are very proud to work with the front runners across different sectors of the industry. Uh, Ericsson is one of them, uh, where we are partnering up uh, with, uh, with them in order for us to get the connectivity that we need in, uh, in the new generation of uh, telecommunication systems. I'm going to open up the question about partnerships to the other panelists. I don't, Anna, you look like you want to come in first. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that I think it's a very good point that you're making, that uh, it's easy to just look into the supply chain, but we very much need the digital tools uh, to optimize again our customers' processes because that's where 98% of our scope is. So we should not forget about those tools. They are very, very important. And there goes in the AI solutions and other very basic uh, here and now digital tools like you say, Mats. Mats or Christian, would you like to come in to give examples of where you're working in partnership and you know, any specific things that you can mention? Well, I think uh, this whole exponential roadmap initiative that we are part of is such a partnership. And for Eric, partnership is, is uh, almost everything that we do. I mean, when we talk about what key SDGs that we are aiming at, one is number nine because we provide the infrastructure and the innovation, but the other one is really number 17, part in partnerships. So I think, uh, just giving an example, I think Exponential Roadmap is in interesting because it's uh, a mix not only of, of uh, business partners, it is really a partnership between academia, where we have uh, scientists, science-based approach, but also with uh, civil society and NGOs. So I think it's a really interesting partnership where we provide on equal terms into the reports and into the work. And uh, so I think that's uh, a great example of partnerships. But there, there are partnerships everywhere. And if we, if we talk about digitalization, uh, I think if we look at the ICT sector, our industry, that's 1.4% of global carbon emissions. And w with sort of existing solutions, the pre-5G solutions, we have the 15%. So that's 10 times our own emissions that we can sort of support other industries if that is scaled right. And then we have an additional five, at least 5% 5 with the AI and 5G solutions like Einride is providing. And I think that opportunity is much bigger, in fact. So I think that, that looking at 
that needs to happen in partnerships because now we're not talking one industry, one value chain, because now we're talking outside of our own value chain. And then we need to sort of definitely partner across. And, and, and for that to happen, if we are going to electrify, like Einroy talked about, transports, for instance, in Europe, it cannot be that uh, one charger talks one language, French, and another one talks German, because the trucks, they go across Europe. So we have to have a common standard, a common language across industries. And this is the first time when we create standards that go across industries, because we have created the, the telecom standard, the GSM, the 5G, whatever standard we have in our industry. Same for the energy sector, they have their standards. And the transport road sector, they have their own standards. But nowhere do the AI talk the same language. So I think that's a challenge that we will see. We need sort of common language between different uh, industries now. So partnerships will be essential. I'm going to pick up on that point because where you're talking about there is regulation. And actually that comes on to policy, which comes on to some of the, the kind of the bigger discussions that are happening here. So I suppose my next question is in terms of, you know, and this is to, you know, whoever wants to kind of come in on it is actually what is the role of policy to support this? And, you know, where can you work in partnership with government to actually deliver this and, and therefore kind of create those collaborations? Uh, Anna's looking, I, Anna and then Matt's and then I am going to go to Christopher because I imagine on transport there is a lot there in terms of working with government. I think it's everywhere, so we can all pitch in on that. Uh, we need standards. If I just look at sustainability point of view, there's no standard uh, on an international level for reporting on sustainability. I hope there will be very soon, but that's uh, just one. Uh, then if you talk about what you said, Mats, on digitalization, uh, there's really important to, for us to be able to share data between us. And how do you do that without the standards in place? Uh, like just very easy, we have uh, sensors uh, sensing vibrations on our rotating equipment, uh, but how do we secure uh, that data, not getting into other someone else's hands, uh, and how do you transfer that data? Uh, to be very specific, and that's all over the place. Uh, but we work together in partnerships to try to push for the regulations in, uh, for example, with ABB and lots of others uh, in the energy efficiency movement, uh, working together with ICC on policy making, etc. So we really try to make our point here because it's so important. Yep. So uh, I think one of the key aspects, if we talk about policy, is really um, without the digital highway, we cannot have digitalization. And I think it's a big problem, both sort of in, in um, a global perspective, uh, but also in a European perspective, because 5G is built in US and it's built in, in um, Korea, China and, and Japan, and it's starting to be built in Europe, we are long behind. So if we want to have European industries competing on this, uh, they, we really need to build sort of the infrastructure, otherwise it will not happen. So I think that's, that's an extremely important part. The other part is that digitalization is not understood in sort of these negotiations. So uh, the easy examples of, of building that I took earlier, if you take the EU, uh, EU taxonomy, that would not count as, as sort of within the green part of taxonomy. So if you, if you do changes that are sort of incremental in your own industry, that's okay. But whole uh, infrastructure digitalization is not included. So uh, I think there is one good initiative now with the European uh, Green Digital Coalition that's trying to do that and trying to create standards for how to uh, sort of measure the importance of digitalization. But I think that is, I mean, a big gap uh, across the, all of this that we don't see the use of digitalization in the negotiations or anywhere in, in, in this forum. Um, Christopher, would you like to come in? Yeah, I would love to. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, policy have had a tendency of uh, being uh, lagging behind technological innovation. That is usually how the interplay between technological and innovation and institutional change have, have looked. Take Uber and Airbnb. They didn't ask for permission to commercially deploy their systems across cities around the world. Instead, they simply did it. Yeah, we are now in a generation 
of, uh, uh, of collaboration where public actors and agencies are um, very interested in being on board as the technology progresses. And one example of how that looks like in practice is the largest flagship project that we have in, in the world on electric and autonomous transportation. It's a European Union funded project where a constellation of 35 actors coming both from industry but also from the public sector uh, and uh, uh, also including the public agencies and authorities that are um, in, in the end uh, going to be very involved in ensuring that we have a safe commercial deployment going forward of these technologies. So the collaboration aspect between on the one hand side the companies that provides the technological solutions and on the other hand side the institutional actors that will build the frameworks of tomorrow. Today we are going to go hand in hand and meet these uh, challenges that we have in, in a way where the lag is gone uh, and that um, really indicates that we will be able to speed up a lot of these transitions that we need to have in place as soon as possible. Brilliant, thank you. And I'm going to say, if there are any questions from the audience, please do raise your hands and there's an opportunity to ask if there's anything you want to. Um, I'm just going to, because actually you mentioned there, Christopher, about you know, challenge, which is that sometimes policy lags behind, but that also means there's an opportunity probably for business to take a lead. But I just want to ask, is there's, you know, what challenges or barriers do you all see today in terms of enabling this to move forward and kind of enabling acceleration? So. I don't know, Christopher, if you want to come in. Christian, sorry. <laughs> Christian, yes. Um, so I think policy is moving in the right direction in terms of mandatory carbon disclosures. We're seeing it in the European Union. We're seeing it all over the world. We're going to see it in the US, hopefully, by 2025. Uh, but a really important aspect of carbon disclosure is comparability, obviously. You know, you want carbon disclosures of one legal entity to be comparable to the carbon disclosures of another legal entity. And right now we don't have that level of standardization on carbon accounting. So that means that today you can't compare, has the carbon emissions of this legal entity, does it have the same scope as the carbon emissions of this legal entity? And I know that the industry is trying to solve that problem. So speaking of partnerships again, I mean, you, you mentioned the great work that is going on at the World Business Council on the Pathfinder Initiative. Uh, we are very much a part of, of that discussion uh, as well. So I think industry now are working on kind of trying to patch some of those uh, problems with carbon accounting. So you can have digitization uh, uh, of, of, of carbon accounting in the, in the first place. Um, but uh, at some point in time, I think that uh, policymakers have to realize that you know, uh, carbon disclosures is not going to be a silver bullet unless you solve the accounting problem. Uh, and that is what I've kept you know, kind of re repeating myself because there's this huge, huge opportunity in terms of some of the largest enterprises in the world and, and certainly you as well, like you're committed to net zero your entire, in, in your entire value chain, but you need the right data. Everyone needs the right data and everyone is grappling with it and we all need to work together to, to fix it. And I think uh, policymakers can and should certainly uh, facilitate that discussion down the line. Max? Uh, I think uh, other than just for our value chains, I talked about the, I mean, the one and a half towards the 15% that we talk about enablement effect. I think for that to be truly understood, we need to have also standards and ways of, of uh, uh, describing that in a credible way so people trust the savings that they are there and they are true. Because then I think when you start measuring things, then it becomes visible and then you can sort of start driving them as well, I think, in a different way. So I, I think. Uh, I agree with what you said on, on, on the data in the value chain. Hugely important for us to be able to sort of do our own homework and, and make sure that we can reduce our own emissions and our value chain emissions from, from sort of supply chain and, and the use of our products by customers. But also then, uh, in a similar way, understanding what we can enable and how to measure that. And I mean, we will never take the credit for that, but we will demonstrate the importance of digitalization, AI and 5G. I could just add that, of course, it's standardization, it's a policies, but also 
I think we lack many times the the data. We need to start collect more data, and we need to do that with the right quality. Uh, so both collecting is a problem, or not collecting, and the data quality being too poor, and that's a huge challenge to us, both on our own uh, internal case, but also mostly in external. And I would also raise that we see a huge challenge when it comes to digitalization and lack of competence in society because it's a, such a huge shift that we're seeing. Uh, if we, we talk now about scopes, but if we talk about robots, I, AI, we have manufacturing sites where we do a huge shift uh, using AI tools and robots and digitalization to make our production units much more efficient to bring down our emissions. So the lack of the right competences and the competence shift I would say it's a huge challenge as well. Um. Can I just check, were there any questions at all? Did anyone want to ask anything? No? Um, so was there, oh, there is, oh, brilliant, thank you. If we just pass the microphone very quickly. And if you can just please introduce yourself as well. Best. Yeah, I'm Romain Poivet. Uh, I'm uh, engagement lead from the World Benchmarking Alliance, but I'm also uh, the ch yeah the convener of the ISO TC207 SC7 Working Group 4 on, on GAG accounting standards, and I'm a bit uh, confused when you speak about the lack uh, the lack of uh, robust standards, for instance, regarding GAG quantification, and I feel like that uh, there is already lots of standard regarding JD quantification. We're about to launch a new um, uh, appendix in the ISO 4064-1 standard on the avoided emission aspect. So how basically you can avoid emissions with the use of uh, products, for instance. So that could be a use case for uh, digitalization. So yeah, I would like to invite you to be involved in ISO standardization. Uh, can I? Yes. Uh, one point to, uh, for me is that when I look at uh, our suppliers and customers, not everyone is using ISO. There's a use of many, many different standards uh, in the production, in all different areas that we act. So yes, there are standards, but we need to decide which standards should we use on a global level, So because everything is connected. And I agree, there's so many good ISO standards. But we need to just, again, agree what should we use, everyone. And I think you are also, uh, the, the avoided emission standards, I mean, we are part of developing that from Ericsson's side. So the same people that are writing the ITU standard are also working with the ISO standard. So for sure, we know about that. And we think it's greatly appreciated. So I think that that is... That will be extremely important for the enablement effect and for avoided emissions, those two standards that are coming out from International Telecom Union and ISO. So definitely kudos to that. But I, I think there is still a gap. The gap is between industries that I talked about, where there is no standard for sort of how to talk between an energy system and a road transport system and the mobile telecommunication system. In a, in a same, I mean, for emissions, yes, but not for data. And that is... So, I, I mean, of course, there exists lots of standards. I mean, there exists plenty of ISO standards for uh, management, life cycle assessments. There exist standards for uh, avoided emissions, the avoided emissions framework. We have the greenhouse gas protocol. We have plenty of standards. Uh, but a lot of these standards need to be more specific in order to yield comparable results, especially when it comes to modeling uh, carbon data in value chains and how to uh, essentially replace modeled data for activities-based data in, in value chains. And, and I mean, that is one of the reasons we started the SME Climate Hub. That is what the Pathfinder Initiative is, is, is trying to fix. But then also what emission factors should you apply in which contexts in that sort of value chain modeling. So there's a lot of things that needs to be more specific uh, in, in order to have really that, you know, 100% uh, uh, comparability, especially in, in, in scope three. Okay, we're coming towards the end of our time now. And if there is any qu other questions, please do raise your hands quickly. 
If not, we will move on. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to kind of do some final thoughts. And partly this I'd like to think about a kind of key takeaway or recommendation, but particularly, I mean, Max, you mentioned around, you know, the the kind of the education that's needed around some of the negotiations and actually how this becomes part of the conversation. So I suppose I, I'm going to ask you to frame that in terms of, you know, what would you like to come away from COP27 with in terms of actually being able to take this forward, accelerate it, and make sure that there's action happening beyond COP27? I don't know, Christine, I'll come to you first and then we'll go around. Uh, yeah. That's all, Matt. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe we can take the internet. Take it in turn to have Christopher next, yeah. Fine, right. Fine, right. Sure. Fine, right. From our perspective, we have, um, during this session, covered a lot of the opportunities that digitalization enables. But the fact of the matter is that we also need to do something else, and that is to stop supporting the legacy systems that have gotten us to where we are in the first place. We have tens of thousands of diesel-dependent jobs in the road trans transport industry. And stopping uh, the subsidies that each and every year are poured into this industry by banning fossil fuel subsidies globally once and for all, that would be an outcome that we would very much applaud. Because if we do that, that would enable us to focus on what we need to do, and that is to scale the systems of the future that are clean, green and also resilient, considering the fact that the demand for transports are going to double up until 2050. So banning fossil fuel subsidies in order for us to focus on the things that we have ahead of us, building the industries of tomorrow. Brilliant. I'll come a little in line, so I'll get to Christian next. Well, I think my takeaway is that what gets measured gets managed. And right now we're in a situation where we have been obsessed around, does a company have a net zero target or not? Or not? Which is great. That made us, you know, uh, go where we are today, but in subsequent COP, I want us to be obsessed around uh, carbon performance, which essentially means like, are you on track of actually fulfilling your targets on a year to year basis? Are you reducing your emissions fast enough to really be aligned with 1.5? Because in the end, we can't uh, negotiate with nature, we need to reduce carbon emissions and we needed to slash them in half by, by next decade. So that's what I would like everyone to take home with them, you know, being obsessed about the performance piece and not just the commitments. We have seven years and two months until uh, 2030. And if we're going to be able to half emissions by then, we need to scale the existing solutions. I think we need to take the digital solutions that we have today and scale them fast and do that in the right way. And I think that needs to get an acknowledgement from the political side. But I think I'm not so hopeful for the political process to fix this without us. So I think we really need to work in partnerships as companies to drive this now. And, and that is what I would like to see. Yes, and my takeaway is very much like yours, Matt, that COP is to me about partnerships and deepening our relations so we can work on this very complex issue or challenge that we're having. Nobody's going to make it on their own. We have to, and data is power and knowledge. So collecting that with the right quality and working together in partnerships with a deep trust that's what I'm hoping for. Brilliant. Thank you very much to all of you. I have to say my takeaway, I think, is actually the important role of the SME Climate Hub as well, which many of you have talked about, and actually the engagement as well with supply chains. I'm going to thank all of our speakers today. Thank you for listening as well, and I hope you found that a beneficial session. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. Hello and welcome to uh, this uh, exciting new session that we have in the Pioneer the Possible Pavilion. This session uh, is all about the Swedish industry transition and how fossil free steel can lead the transition across the world, how it can change the world. I'm going to, my name is Robert Watt. Um, I'm today's moderator uh, for our discussion. Uh, I'm here as part of the Secretariat for the Leadership Group for Industry Transition, which was an initiative bringing together countries and companies with the highest ambitions to decarbonize heavy industry, and it is chaired by Sweden and India. Uh, today we've got a fantastic panel for you. We also have a, a, a keynote speaker, but before I hand over to our keynote speaker, just a few few facts and figures around steel and fossil free steel. About 2 billion tonnes of steel is produced every year. It makes up 8% of global emissions. We are seeing a slight decline, globally speaking, in energy in, 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 um, in the carbon dioxide intensity of steel. And there's a real pipeline of exciting projects in fossil free or very low carbon steel production and there are targets in place by a very large number of international uh, uh, steel companies. Some of that information you can find on the Leadership Group for Industry Transitions Green Steel Tracker available on our website. But the speed of transition is not fast enough. We need to change not just in the niche markets of Sweden but also across the world. And it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce you to our first speaker, our keynote from Johan Fochel, who is Minister for International Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade. Mr. Fochel, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear everyone. Good afternoon. It's a uh great pleasure for me to be here at Thomas Sheik and uh, the Swedish pavilion at COP27. And uh, as the new Minister for Development Cooperation and Trade, which was pointed out here, I am very eager to uh, really spread the word about the many groundbreaking solutions that not only drive climate action in Sweden, but it also supports the green transition all across the world. It can be in nuclear, it can be renewable energy, it can be energy efficiency, green steel, transportation, waste management, or the financial sector. We do have a very broad range of sectors where so many Swedish companies can contribute to the spreading of green footprint to other countries. And this panel here today is about one of them, fossil free steel and how it can change the world. And I think it's really a, it's really an opportunity to share our technical knowledge and practical experience of responding to the urgent climate situation. And we invite you to, be, to, to partner with us. And as early movers in Sweden, we really want to inspire other, inspire other countries in the belief, and I think this is very important, that this transition is not only necessary, but it can truly be done. And it's an, also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for trade, for growth, for new markets, and for prosperity. And as you know, Sweden aims to be climate neutral by 2045 at the latest. And this transition, as I said, is also good for the economy. And in adopting this new approach, new growth and new jobs, and in the end, more healthy societies in many ways are created as well. And let me start by sharing the story of industrial um, transition in Sweden. And in fact, taking into account the uh, historical investments and technology breakthroughs that have been realized, I think we now can even talk about an ongoing industrial revolution. Not the least in the northern parts of Sweden, which used to be an area of depopulation. For example, battery production uh, with Northvolt in the lead, Fossil free steel with hybrid that uh, SSSB will here today will tell you more about, as well as H2 green steel and other technologies, electrification of transport, chemical recycling of plastics. I am really looking forward to this panel to take part in the discussions and learn 
from some true pioneers of the companies present in this panel. I appreciate the opportunity to listen and learn from these companies and to focus about the possibilities, not the obstacles. Thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing from this great panel. Minister, thank you very much uh, for providing those uh, words of inspiration for us um, and also prefiguring this fantastic panel. Um, I'm sure there is a great deal that we will learn from hearing from them. And I'm going to split up our panel. We actually have six panellists for you. Um, we've decided to break it into two panels to make it slightly easier uh, for us to get everybody on stage. And I'm going to invite our first panel to join me uh, on stage now. Uh, Martina Montesino Malmberg from the Swedish Energy Agency. Martin Pei from SSAB and Annika Ramfeld from Vattenfall. Welcome. <laughs> Grab a microphone, guys. Super. Well, look, um, we've already heard of, of some of these um, pioneers in the space of uh, in decarbonizing industry. Um, I'd like to start actually off with. with Martina, if I may, uh, because you, you, you work at the Swedish Energy Agency. You're not a company like these other guys here. So what's your role and what's the role of the energy agency in this industry transition and what are the success stories that you've had? Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. And yes, I'm here representing the Swedish Energy Agency. We see the green energy transition as in an integrated part in whole society at all levels, both nationally and internationally. And that is why we support projects, companies, uh, along the whole value chain, in innovation value chain, from fundamental research to implementation and export. And one of our, of our biggest programs uh, in order to support the industry is the Industrial Leap program where we have supported the hybrid project, which I guess you will talk more about soon. And um, the purpose with the, uh, this program is to support the industry in order to decarbonize and also to contribute to enable the decarbonization of the whole society. And we focus on implementation of new technologies, innovation, and new ideas and we really uh, look at like projects with collaboration in between different companies also universities but also this partner private a private public partnership in order to lower risks at an early stage in 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 the project i think this hybrid project is a really good example we will see what we can achieve if we do this together. But we also have this uh, international perspective because we, of course, we need to lower our emissions within the Swedish borders. But in order to reach the climate goals on a global level, which I think is, is, the, is it's the most important goal, we need to collaborate all with other countries. And we have several programs within international collaboration. Uh, one new initiative is the Sweden-US Green uh, uh, Transition Program in order to collaborate for this global climate goal. Yeah. So that is our role. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Martina. So you, you, you're right at the start there. You're not perhaps... Uh, following through and giving money to these companies all the time, but you're there really to prime the pumps, pump, prime the pumps, and get things started with that early stage. Can I can I turn to Annika now and, and ask you, Annika? Um, you're you're from Vattenfall. Vattenfall is an energy company. Why is why are you here? Why are you so important for this industry transition? Well, first of all, for us, in order for us to be able to build all the renewable energy that Minister was talking about. 
we need, of course, the steel for the wind towers. We need the steel for all the grid uh, towers as well. So steel is very integrated into the supply chain and what we need to do. And we have as a, a direction to really enable fossil-free living within a generation. And that means that it's not enough that we build all this fossil-free energy. We also need to secure that the full value chain is fossil-free. And steel, along with cement, copper, aluminum, are key, uh, really stand for the majority of the footprint in our supply chain. And therefore, it was very natural for us to start approaching uh, a company like SSAB and LKAB, looking at how can electricity and Vattenfall contribute to ensure that we transform other sectors to go away from fossil fuels and instead use renewable electricity, uh, and, and that's when we then started the dialogue and found that we had a joint target. It was really great to see that we now, in a very short period, have managed to get the joint venture in place and now already, like Martin will talk about, really deliver and we will hear also the off-takers later on in, in this panel that it's not only an idea, it's gone all the way from a clear idea into actually piloting it and now producing and using it. Thank you, Annika. Uh, let me turn to Martin now. Um, we've heard about the, the need to have the support from the Swedish Energy Agency, from government. We've heard about the need to connect up with partners who go there not only as key enablers for you, but also as partners along the value chain. Tell us a little bit more, Martin, about what has really enabled SSAB and the other partners in hybrid to come together. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Annika mentioned, steel is extremely important for the modern society. Uh, the minister also talked about uh, this is a possibility for Sweden, but also for the world. Steel is needed for almost everything, producing electricity, for wat water we drink, food production, everything needs steel. But currently steel is a part of the problem for climate change, because the steel is needed to be produced uh, not only from recycled scrap, which is not enough. We need every year produce about one billion ton, more than one billion ton of steel from iron ore. And that is where this 8% Robert mentioned CO2 emission comes from. We need to continue to produce steel from iron ore, but uh, then we need to develop a breakthrough technology so that we can produce steel from iron ore without CO2 emission. That was uh, the really reason why in 2016 SSAB teamed up with Vattenfall and LKB want to really take the challenge of developing this technology that can be applied at commercial scale so we solve the problem steel has instead of turn it into an opportunity and we got a great support from an agency uh, so that we can do very extensive R&D program so, so far we have spent in total around 200 million U US dollars for this research program. We have shown that this technology works. We have delivered steel to Volvo Group, who have delivered trucks. They announced today the first electrical driven trucks using fossil free steel for the mainframe to Amazon. It's a great achievement. Earlier they have delivered uh, a yellow truck to NCC, which is actually running uh, in southern Sweden. So technology works and we really solve the problem from the root cause. Instead of uh, producing steel and generating 8% of world's CO2 emission, now with the hybrid technology we, se we have proven, it actually emits only water. I have a wa bottle of water from the hybrid pilot plant which we can take care of and even purify it back to drinking water. So we are really now moving ahead with this, and now we have a, a very uh, aggressive plan. We want to speed up our uh, transition, a big investment program we have uh, launched that we want to be, take away 10% of Sweden's uh, CO2 emission around 2030. That is uh, our aim, and, and that has been a great success because we have teamed up with uh, partners, but also our customers so that we will listen more uh, soon that will uh, have access to this fossil fuel steel. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, 
Annika, I want to come back to you and ask about what you see as being some of the remaining challenges uh, for Vattenfall, but also for you know this ecosystem of, of actors and companies and organizations involved in, in the industry transition and the green transition. What, what are those challenges? Perhaps start off with those that you're facing in Sweden or in Europe, and then perhaps more globally as well. Well, if I start with the challenges that we see, one key challenge is, of course, to secure that we get the permissions and acceptance of building all this new energy that is needed. And, and there I, I do have to say, earlier we talked about NIMBY, so don't, not in my backyard. But these days, uh, I see a very worrying trend, trend, and we started to call it banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. And I think... This is something that we need to get around. We need to get everyone to realize that in order for us to do this very important transition to transit the transport sector, the heavy industries, we need to secure that we can also build the energy needed for that. And that means that we cannot, everyone cannot say, yes, I like it, but not here. We need to realize that any industry that need to do it need to have the electricity close to it. And if we want to have a city where we can go with electric buses, we need to accept that there is wind farms or solar panels or any other means of electricity close to that. So that is one of the key sort of challenges. But if I want to be on the more optimistic side, what I also want to add, a partnership like this with hybrid. Here we test how to store hydrogen and produce it. That technology can then be transferred to other sectors. Uh, so we know now that we are able to store hydrogen. That hydrogen is a very good means of also storing electricity that is then produced, for instance, with the more uh, intermittent wind sources like wind and solar. So that's a source of storage that we learn in this partnership. So I think in general, we need to realize that we start a partnership with one specific idea of what we want to accomplish. But very often we learn things that we can then multiply and apply in other sectors. And that's really the beauty about doing things in partnerships. Brilliant. Before I come to Martin, actually, I'm going to hop over to Martina, actually, because I think some of the things that Annika was beginning to touch upon in terms of uh, there's a positive note, there are opportunities here, but we need to grasp, grasp them. Perhaps you want to talk to us a little bit about, you know, from a, a point of view of energy, how do we use it, how do we prioritise its use, but also how do we make sure that we've got enough of it? What are, what are the sort of principles that, that you and the Energy Agency are, are working with? I think that... Yeah, the main principle is that we really need to focus on many things at the same time. We really need to have a number of technology in order to be able to do this transition. And I'm really happy that you mentioned uh, the hydrogen uh, uh, storage. I actually visited it uh, last winter. But th that is one really good example on a technology that is uh, under development right now. But we we need to look in, into ev ev all, all kinds of technologies. We have wind, we have nuclear power, we have solar power, etc. But we also need to look into the material and energy efficiency and also now with this energy crisis we're in right now, how do we use the energy? How can we use it in a smart way in order to save energy for a good purpose? Thank you very much, Martina. I'd like to come back to you, Martin, if I may. And uh, you, you've begun to talk a little bit about how you've enabled the transition. What about the rest of the value chain and the role, the role of demand, the people who are actually going to buy this product? So you tell us a bit about why it matters and how you've persuaded them that you've got the right amount of the material at the right price available to them. Yes, uh, when we started uh, the hybrid initiative, uh, a lot of uh, our peers uh, and also customers uh, were uh, uh, not sure if this uh, new technology produced uh, steel would be too costly. What we have shown uh, so far is the technology we have developed is actually producing a superb quality of products and also more cost efficiently. Uh, so that provides uh, the opportunity for us, uh, together with our customers, uh, to really move ahead with the quick transition decisions. Uh, we know that uh, initially 
the technology will cost more because uh, the uh, industry is not major enough. For example, electrolyzer uh, industry has not scaled up enough. But we believe strongly, just like what happened with the wind power, solar power, when the industry takes off, the cost curve will come down. That was our common belief that we have had with our great partnership customers. They shared the same vision as us. So they believed even in the beginning this will cost slightly more, but this is the right way to go because we solve the root cause of CO2 emissions. And our scope one, scope two emission is uh, scope three emission for our customers. So we need to work really in the value chain because steel industry cannot solve the whole emission issue alone. We need work with energy companies, mining companies, and then like Volvo, like Alfa Laval, and uh, PIAB, all the customers that are waiting for fossil free steel. Uh, with joint uh, efforts, we can make this change. Now we have shown this is possible. So we are here really to share this experience of this uh, collaboration, success story, but also inspire others to see the opportunities. Because this creates great business opportunities. And we just announced one month ago that we have uh, filed in hybrid a portfolio of patents. We want to share this know-how with the rest of the world. Because if we cut 10% uh, Sweden CO2 emission, of course it's good, but it's not going to save the world. We can save the world when this technology is used by, by China, India, many others. Then we can really make a big impact. Thank you very much, Martin. You've actually managed to answer the last question I was going to ask. Uh, but it, I'm going to ask it anyway because I'd like to offer it to the whole of the panel. The, you know, the title of our session is about changing the world. And we've seen how it can be done, how it's starting to happen in Sweden, maybe a few other countries where some of these ideas are being picked up. But can you say one thing, perhaps, about how you, what you think needs to happen in order to go and scale up from the hybrid plants that we have in Sweden to something that truly changes the world? We've talk, heard a little bit about patents and value chains, but are there other things that you think are critical to get to scale at an international level? Because Unfortunately, just doing it in the north of Sweden isn't enough. Annika, please. Well, well, I think one thing is that we need to secure that there is enough demand. And, and I think there, SSAB and Vattenfall are, are both part of the First Movers Coalition. Uh, and there it's all about creating a very clear demand signal from companies that we want these breakthrough technologies. And that's why we, we have joined to sort of wanting that for steel, for cement, for aviation, for, for trucking, etc. That is a very important thing. And I also think it's by entering into those type of, of uh, initiatives that we then can showcase this good case we have in Sweden where we have built the full value chain. Just show how this can be done and then we since we have promised to buy this, it means that when we as Vattenfall have a discussion with uh, someone that is producing heat exchangers that we will hear about later, or wind turbines, then we ask them, we want to have this fossil-free steel in that. And then you start creating those demand signals. That is a very good way. And then they say, well, we don't know how to do it. Well, we do. We, we know actors that can, and here you also have patents, and you can multiply those. So I think it's really about spreading the word very widely. And that's also the reason why we're here at COP, trying to inspire and show that this is absolutely possible. Martina. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, yeah, I think all kinds of collaboration, crossing all kinds of borders is really important now to, to go, go faster, go further. And this system perspective that we need to focus on so many things at the same time in order to reach the goals. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to, we've got maybe a couple of minutes before I want to bring up our other panel. So I'd actually like to ask if there's anyone in our audience who might have a question, a short question. I can see a hand being waved over here. And a second question at the back afterwards. We'll take one after the other, please. 
So hi, my name is Yvonne. I'm from Delta Electronics Foundation. So um, I have a question for uh, Martin, especially. So you just mentioned that uh, you believe that in the future, uh, the cost of the hydro hydrogen um, steel will go down. But do you have like, um, have you foreseen a timeline that like, when will this technology be scaled up and popularized um, globally? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Let's take another one quickly at the back. And Martin, you can, you can begin answering. Yes. Uh, <laughs> hello, Anna Freeman from the Clean Energy Council in Australia, where we've been watching what you're doing quite closely and very interested in it. Just a question, you mentioned that you're part of a first movers coalition. The question I have is, well, why, what triggered you to do this when you embarked on this journey a few years ago? What was it? And what did you need to get started? Because $200 million, I think, is what you said you've spent so far it's a sizable sum of cash for a steel plant that might not be making big margins. Where did you find it and uh, what do you need to get started? Yes, I start with the first question of, of the cost curve. Um, we know that uh, the first uh, scale up that we are right now planning uh, in, a, in a hybrid uh, uh, collaboration is 2026. We are going to construct the first demonstration plant and the SSAB will uh, shut down the auxiliary zone facility, so we will uh, provide uh, the first uh, volumes commercially to our customers uh, from 2026. And that first investment, we know that will not be very cost efficient because uh, the uh, electrolyzer technology is really scale up yet. But we believe that in the coming five, 10 years, the cost will come down. Uh, and there are a lot of initiatives. The European Union is investing a lot in this uh, hydrogen program. And worldwide, a lot of companies are investing in this. So we are quite confident that uh, sometime in the future, this uh, technology will become cost competitive. And coming back to the second question, why we started this, this initiative? Because the first uh, referring to uh, um, our minister's uh, uh, introduction, Sweden was one of the countries that set the toughest uh, climate goals. It became a climate law 2016. SSAB as a single company, we stand for 10% of Sweden's CO2 emission. So without SSAB taking this seriously, we'll have difficulty to deliver those goals. So that's number one. Number two is that we have been leading this technology development already dec many decades ago. In 1980s, SSAB, LKB, did one of the most significant step change in technology development. Our current blast furnace technology is world leading, but even with that, we are still the largest CO2 emission company. So that was the reason why we said 2016, we need to take next step. And to do that, we need Vattenfall, and we need support from the Swedish energy agency. There's a significant investment program of R&D it was a great uh, courage from SSAB's board, but also our partner's board, to do these investments. Because without these investments, we would not have been standing here to show this really works. So, very important. Uh, uh, just uh, one comment to um, your last question uh, regarding how to scale up this quickly. We believe the world needs to put a price on C2. Uh, good system in Europe now, but it's uh, lacking many other places in the world. That is a very important driver, we believe. The second, the world needs to agree upon a common standard. What should be called for green steel or near zero emission steel? Because today there is no transparency, there is no credibility, and we need to create that. And third, we need to have a level playing field. We can't uh, have a, a regulatory framework that punish the front runners. We need to create the momentum so that this transition can happen quickly. M may I also answer on, on your questions on why we as Vattenfall entered into the partnership? It is because it's our absolute true belief that in order for us to safeguard 
the future business models and secure that we are a company that are ready to take the, the challenges of the future. We need to go this way. There is no other way. We know the climate is sending very seriously clear signals on what needs to be done. And for us, we say that we don't do it because we think it's our responsibility. We do it because we believe that it makes business sense. We learn, like I said already, how to store electricity as, as hydrogen. We secure that we have the fossil free steel for what we're building for the future, that we have the fossil free cement, etc. It is absolutely necessary. So I, I have a very hard time to believe that people say you cannot do it, it's too high premium. I would say if you don't do it, you are risking that you are going to be obsolete in a few years' time because you don't have a business model that customers are asking and wanting. So, so, so for me, it, it is really a business driver and the business reasons for doing this. Thank you, Annika. Um, and thank you very much to the whole of this panel. Thank you to the, those two really great questions as well. Thank you uh, from everybody. And now we will move on to our second panel. And our second panel, we have two people joining us online. So I now cross my fingers. You should probably also cross your fingers to hope that everything works. Ah, fantastic. Linnea, you're with us. Linnea Peterson from Volvo Cars. I'd like to invite Thomas Mollet to come up from Alpha Laval. And do we also have our final guest from Payab, Anna Hergberg? Let's see. Yes, hello Anna, welcome. Great to have you with us today. Super. Um, I'm gonna kick off with a question that I think perhaps goes for all of you. Um, all of you as members of the value chain um, here that we've, we've begun to hear about. And I hope you feel that your ears have been burning red about how important you are to, to really be uh, a key actors in changing uh, this industry. But what is the role of fossil free steel in your own sustainability transition. I'm actually gonna start um, online, if it's all right with you, Thomas. And I'm gonna start with Anna, because I can see you quite clearly at the moment. Anna. Yeah. Um, it's a big part of our, our business. After mapping our uh, sources of greenhouse gas emission, we can state that materials uh, we use in our production account for a significant part of our operations, total emissions. And, and looking at the different materials uh, within our constructions, we see that steel is one of the biggest contributors. Um, so we want to start with our biggest flows of, of material and, and change this into a decarbonization uh, uh, way. So um, steel is really important. And we also, uh, within PAB, we have um, several initiatives within our own operations where we also see initiatives such as low uh, carbon concrete, asphalt and mineral aggregates. So we see a strong pull for just entering partnerships with our external suppliers in order to develop low carbon solutions, uh, which are crucial in the way of reaching our climate neutrality in, in 2045. Thank you very much, Anna. A couple of points I think it's really interesting to pick up on that is, is first of all, of course, you, you need to engage uh, with your suppliers, SSAB and, and others, to meet your own sustainability targets. And also that, that, that this is something that is happening in more than one sector. So actually, you're looking for a decarbonisation in, in many different industrial sectors. So it's a, it's a sort of a vision and approach uh, for the company as a whole. And now I'd like to ask Thomas the same sort of question. What, why is, what's the role of fossil fuel steel for you in Alpha Laval? Yeah, so <clears throat> I brought uh, a piece of equipment with me here just so everybody get a feel for what we are, we are doing. And this is a heat exchanger and uh, we are deploying uh, millions of these every year. And that is actually equal to uh, around 100 gigawatt in energy savings. And that is 50 million ton CO2. That's the same emission as Sweden. So we, we need more of these units out, and that, that's our main contribution to the Paris Agreement, you could say. But of course, we also need to get our own house in order. And as you see, this unit is uh, full of steel. Um, and we want to have carbon neutral products by 2030. And that is uh, not many years away. So uh, that's why we launched this collaboration with SSAB in end of May 
to say we, we need to get access to uh, fossil free steel and we're actually now having the first unit just some months after and we will deliver first units to customers in next year. Uh, and that is to have um, energy, uh, the uh, footprint savings on our own technologies. And we have been out, take, uh, so we are an off-taker to SSAB, and we have been out testing the markets now, uh, coming out to data centers, coming out to the chemical industry, uh, coming out to electrolyzer producers with a lot of heat exchangers around and say, are you interested in heat exchangers with fossil-free steel? And there is such a pull. So I think that is our role here, that we can get our own house in order, but we can also help getting the, the scalability going by coming out in so many more industry verticals and, and getting the fossil free steel out there. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you very much, Thomas. That's very, very inspiring in terms of the numbers that you're talking about and how you're really enabling a whole other set of value chains as well to begin to decarbonize. And I'd now like to turn to, uh, to Volvo, please. Linnea, you're with us on screen now. Um, so same question to you. What's the role of uh, fossil-free steel for your sustainability transition? For us, it's absolutely critical. Uh, we as a company have a target to become climate neutral by 2040, and that includes scope one, two, and three. So we need to be able to find near zero materials uh, to be able to get there. So all the materials that are used in the vehicle, and today steel is still the sort of largest material group uh, in the vehicle, which means that being able to find near zero steel is a must for us, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why Volvo cars use the Zero Steel or Steel Zero uh, organization this spring in order to really show the need for the near zero steel within the automotive industry uh, to encourage not just SSRB, but other steel makers around the world to speed up their uh, climate neutrality roadmaps. Uh, because this is uh, a huge pull within the industry for this material. Can I, can I follow that up uh, with you, Linnea, and, and maybe others might want to come in, because I think it's quite interesting. You, you're, you're beginning to be customer-facing. Okay, maybe not completely, cons uh, Linnea, you're becoming, you know, Volvo cars, consumer-facing almost. Can, can you just tell us a little bit about you know, what is it that means that your customers are prepared to pay a bit of a premium or why is it they want uh, uh, this? Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, I think it's an important part of the transformation towards electricity, the electrical vehicle, that we know that that has a high footprint due to the batteries. And of course, if you're going for a car that throughout its lifetime will have a lower carbon footprint, you also want the entire vehicle to have a lower footprint when it leaves our production gates. Uh, so we see a lot of the customers asking us for this, what are the carbon footprints of the different vehicles? Uh, and we also see the fleet customers. You know, we're here producing a product that will help our customers reduce their CO2 targets. And I mean, looking at the sort of European companies, there are a lot of companies that have sort of climate neutrality uh, roadmaps and targets in line with us, sort of 2040 or before 2040. And that means that they need to find mobility solutions for their sort of staff. And that's where both we and sort of other European brands will come in and sort of help that transition. So we are getting asked uh, about the carbon footprint of vehicles and how we will reduce that as we go forward. Thanks, Thomas. I can uh, do the consideration of that. I think this is, we all run around and say, we need to go into action mode, right? And. Uh, I could have said to Martin, um, well, when, when you have the same price, then we will be interested, right? But uh, we, we need to go into action and we all need to chip in. And uh, we, we are very ambitious in our own uh, carbon emission targets. And we have a lot of customer relations where they have high ambitions as well. So enabling those relations and say, because they are also saying, how can we go in action mode? And here's a very concrete example. The next heat exchanger you buy, it's a bit more expensive, but we, we get through it, we get the scalability, uh, we get to 2026, 20, 27, and then prices will start to come down. But if we all chip in and do some action now, then, then we will co come over this. If we all want the, the, the future perfect, 
it it uh, it kills uh, all all initiatives right now. So um, and I I think we have so many customers that are that want to show action. Thank, thanks very much, Thomas. Um, Anna, if you're still with us, I mean I I wanted to bring this to you. I mean you also uh, have a, a, a tale to tell about the conversations you have with your customers and, and why is it that they're prepared to go for this. And I'm particularly interested because I, I can imagine that some of your customers may well be uh, public procurement uh, 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 customers as well. Yeah, we, see, we already see a, a great customer demand that are increasing both from the, from the uh, private sector, but from the public sector as well. Uh, and they uh, are really leading the, the transition in Sweden in some ways and putting out really high demands on, on the construction industry. Uh, and we have from a legislative point of view also from the 1st of January this year, uh, the new act on declaration of buildings. So from now on, all the buildings in Sweden need to uh, declare the climate impact on a project level. Uh, and we can see uh, that from 2027 or as early as 2025, uh, the National Board of Housing, Building and Planning will actually put the limit values on the carbon emission from our buildings. So we need to prepare for that. And also the result from our partnership with SSAB in, in quantifying uh, the emission reduction in relation to fossil free steel will be uh, uh, serve as a basis for those limit values as well to, to be able to plan where uh, we, we are going to uh, be able to reduce our climate impact on the project level, but we also want to look at a national level. What can this have uh, for impact uh, if we scale up this uh, to other construction industries as well? While, while we have you on screen, Anna, I'd like to ask a, a quick question about the international dimension for you. Um, I mean, to what extent is PIAB working in other markets outside of Sweden and the Nordics, and, and how does the what you've described is the approach of PIAB in terms of working for fossil free steel or purchasing fossil free steel and green cement. How does that reflect in perhaps this international dimension and scaling up outside of just uh, Sweden and the Nordics? Mm. Um, of course, PIAB right now is, is a Nordic uh, company and we are present in the Nordic, uh, in the Nordic countries. Uh, but we are seeing our partnership now that we have an interest in a, in a different scale. And, and we actually just handed in a, a research application in order to make our findings more public and, and reach out to other sectors. And, and uh, the focus now is to quantify it on a national level. But we, of course, see the possibility to scale up this in, in other sectors as well. Um, so, so we want to be the... Uh, the first company, but we also want to spread the word and, 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 and actually make these numbers available. And also we want to look into what part of a building can we exchange uh, because it's, it's a complex structure and also uh, we need to look at the civil engineering parts as well. So we have uh, a, a big investigation ahead of us just to make sure that which parts are, are able to, to, uh, to change and, and how uh, much impact will that make so um, yeah that's really interesting Anna and it's a sort of counterpart to what Martin was talking about when he was saying formally speaking we've got patents and now we're going to be making this technology these things available you're talking perhaps more about know-how know-how about how to you know work with these materials and build uh, buildings and, and have construction that is you know, carbon neutral, uh, and and I think that's that's a fascinating way to think about how to spread and disseminate these uh, great innovations and, and new practices. One last question to the three of you, if I may, and be as crisp and succinct as you can, if you can. What do you want to see from the steel sector and others potentially to speed up the transition? And I'll start with Thomas. What would you want to see from the steel sector to really? accelerate i think here we we, we don't have an offtake uh, challenge that's not the bottleneck we we, we need more supply uh, and, we, and we need more than uh, one or two steel provider pioneers i mean uh, i like martin's comment earlier that this really has to be becoming the uh, the industry standard that everybody can produce some 
uh, fossil free steel at least because right now we can sell more than we have access to that that, that is the clear uh, message um, it looks better in uh, five eight years but uh, we can do much more uh, if, if more companies are coming in on the supply side. I saw both Linnea and Anna nodding at that point, but, but if you want to add any other things, Linnea, please. We really need the steel industries to speed up uh, and also need sort of near zero steel available on multiple continents. Volvo Cars has production both in North America, Asia and Europe. And we need to be able to get access to the near zero steel on all those continents for our production. We would also like to see a larger variety of grades being available. Uh, today, with a limited amount of steel manufacturers going towards near zero, we will then see a reduced steel pallet. And of course, in a car, we have a large variety of different steel types and steel grades in there. So we need to be able to source all the types that we have and all the different continents and preferably, you know, much before 2040 when we need to have our climate neutral vehicles on the road. Thanks very much, Linnea. Um, and with a great <laughs> indication of what time scale you need this in. Anna. I just want to uh, acknowledge what the other ones has been saying as well. We also have a problem that not all our products are available from the fossil free perspective at the moment. So we need to scale up that. And we also see a need for transparency within the steel sector in terms of how we quantify the climate impact and how we calculate as well. Um, so um, yeah, more transparency and, and uh, speeding up the transition as well. Thank you very much. So we want, and I'm looking at Martin here a little bit here, we want more steel, we want it in more markets, uh, easily available, we want more grades, um, and we want to have, to have that transparency as well. So what, a, what an opportunity, uh, I think, here, uh, given the demand that, signal that you're hearing just from, from these three uh, players in the market. Thank you very much uh, to all three of you uh, for your contributions today. And we're running slightly over time, so I'm going to only just do a very, very quick summary, which is that I, I think it's been fascinating to hear in this panel the extent to which the, the pioneering efforts and partnerships in Sweden, that now they're at a stage in thinking about how to scale up internationally, and whether that is through building the value chains and working in partnership, using, par uh, using patents and, and really making sure that they get used in as many places as possible, or through uh, sharing the know-how. We've heard many different examples. Um, and of course, the example of export, export of the vehicles, export of heat exchangers. Again, we're seeing how these things can really uh, contribute to changing the world, not just at home. Thank you very much for your attention today.
Can you hear me now? Sorry. Welcome everyone, welcome back to the Swedish Pavilion. Welcome to everyone of you who made yourself comfortable here in the Pavilion and also welcome everyone joining us online from Business Sweden's online web platform and also through We Don't Have Time. So we have gathered some of the most front-running stakeholders from public and private sector, academia and civil society here at COP27 to discuss and showcase some best practice examples on how we can pioneer the possible through innovation, policy and innovations. And today um, I'm going to moderate this session. Uh, my name is Emma Modera Viking. I'm head of sustainability at Business Sweden, which is the Swedish Trade and Invest Council. And I am going to moderate a session on carbon capture storage and how we can create a market for trade of negative emissions and carbon removals. And as you all know, in order for us to reach the Paris Agreement and limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees, we need, of course, to drastically minimize and reduce our emissions. And that is obviously an urgency. But also, according to IPCC, we also need negative emissions. And this is something we're going to discuss today with two different panels. But before inviting the two panels up here on stage to kickstart the discussions on how we can enable the scale of negative emissions, we are handing over the word to you, Anders. You are the CEO of Stockholm Extrigy, and you have an impressive target ahead of you where you are aiming to be the first producer in the world of um, sustainable biocarbon capture storage and also Europe's first large-scale provider and supplier of negative emissions. So I would like to ask you if you kindly can just give us a little introduction to how you're working and also how you're going to actually reach these fantastic ambitions and targets. Thanks, and, and thanks for this session, which will be very interesting to listen to a lot of the other panelists and how they actually will, will make this possible. Uh, what we are doing, actually, we are a district heating and uh, combined heat and power company in Sweden. We are located in Stockholm. We have done the journey of reduction of fossil oil, coal. So we, are, we could, could see clearly that we can't reach net zero without actually also remove some of the carbon dioxide which actually we, we, we have in our operation in scoop two, two and two and scoop three. What we actually could see that we can actually add carbon capture to our biogenic combined heat and power plant and by doing that we can capture close to one million ton of uh, CO2 which then creates negative emissions and, and we can clearly see that this road is necessary, it's necessary for us to do, but we can also see that there's a huge potential uh, in Sweden, in Norway, in Finland and in many other countries which has the possibility to utilize sustainable biomass and then add carbon capture. What we then are doing when we have captured this, this uh, carbon is actually to liquefy it, transport it and then permanently store it under the sea level and it will be there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and it will be mineralized by time. So that is a really removal of carbon from the atmosphere. Impressive and it's truly also a pioneering innovation that, that you currently have developed and developing. And I would like to ask also how, I mean, it's clear also that it's a, as a need for this innovation and we need to scale it. So I wonder how we can create a more efficient market uh, of negative emissions? It's, it's clear for me that we, we have a pathway regarding reduction of fossil emissions, but we need a clear pathway also regarding removals. And in order then to, to have a pathway for removals, we need to have a framework, framework which actually sets the rules so it's actually transparent, it's clear, we can trade with these negative emissions in a way which will be sustainable and also create also investors to see this is something which is really reliable, it gives you a removal in a permanent way and that also is needed in order to reach the Paris Agreement or even to be close to the Paris Agreement. Do you, what would you say would be, I mean there's obviously a lot of possibilities here, but do you have any concrete social economic benefits that you possibly could give us in terms of what this could mean and what that can contribute to society, not only in, yeah, in climate matters, but also in socio-economic matters. 
Yeah, actually, when we started this project, we, we were focusing very much on our own project. But then we realized that this has so huge potential. And it's also create a lo lot of other benefits. So we made a socioeconomic report and could clearly see that in order to reach the Swedish target, we could create 11,000 direct jobs, 20,000 di uh, indirect jobs, and the gross domestic product will gain from this uh, with 24 billion Swedish crowns. That's an enormous sum, and it's much cheaper to do that uh, and to do a pathway where we actually will never reach net zero. So this is really uh, a pathway which is both socioeconomic beneficial and it's also beneficial for the climate. We, we just had the, uh, the Minister of Trade and uh, Development aid here in the previous panel, and he is just refer to exactly that, that the innovations that you are creating today, they're not only efficient and, and important for the green transition to, in order for us to reach the climate targets, but also creating in new jobs and, and growth um, for, for Sweden, but of course also f way outside of our borders as well. And uh, we, it's clear that we can create all these opportunities both in Sweden and outside of Sweden, but also what kind of challenges are you currently seeing in terms of the development of creating this market for negative uh, emissions? If, if I take it from a global, global perspective firstly, and I hope we will have m listen more to the next session in this, in this panel, uh, there is optimism, I would say. There is a uh, 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 feeling that now we need to actually accelerate this journey, we need removal and we need just to set the framework and utilize the Article 6 which actually are promoting as much removal and as much reduction as possible. Uh, and then we need actually to then set standards which makes this a really accountability, makes us accountability, accountable and also transparent so that we can rely on what we are trading when we are trading the, these karma removal certificates in the future. Thank you. And with that, I would actually like to um, extend our panel here. And I would like to invite Frederick Ekström, president of Nasdaq Stockholm, and also Niklas Carlsson, the director for international market development at the Swedish Energy Agency. And Frederick and Niklas, welcome up here on stage. I would like to start with you, Frederick. As, as we have mentioned, we have a huge um, carbon debt. We obviously also have the technologies in place. But how do we maximize this? How can we ensure that we can scale this as fast as possible and, yeah, and the most efficient as possible? Well, I think the role of capital market is really to ensure that capital are allocated where it's needed. And in this stage, there are very, I would say, early technologies. They are not bankable yet. Uh, so we need to promote capital allocation from public uh, and from the private side, because it will not be enough with either or. We have to allocate capital through these projects so they can scale up. And I think that's the role of the market, to make sure that that happens. And that happens through buyers coming to the market, creating a buying signal, a commitment to supplier, maybe through offtake agreement or other type of financial instrument that make others know that if I build out, if I invest in this project and produce this, I have a buyer. And that's what's creating, I would say, the, the, the route for the scale up. But we need to be, as Anders said, we need to have an infrastructure in place that doesn't sort of stop the possibility of this flow to happen. And that's why, again, coming back to Article 6, Article 6 should promote the scale up and not become a hinder to it. Thank you very much, Frederick. Please, Niklas, what, what are your thoughts of this from a, from a public perspective representing the Swedish Energy Agency? No, but um, I, I agree with uh, Fredrik and what he mentioned. I, I think we need support from the government and from the agencies in order to make this transition happen. And that's also why we've been supporting this initiative uh, for quite some years now. And I think one example is standing on the stage with me. And we are also leading the, um, the competence center for BioCCS uh, at the Swedish Energy Agency. So we do believe in this technology. There are some challenges, but there are also a lot of opportunities. So I think we need to create a platform where we can discuss both the challenges, but primarily the opportunities in order to set up a whole ecosystem that will work, I think. Thank you. And would you just give us a little more information on how you are supporting this process currently at the Swedish Energy Agency? 
Sure. So we support it financially um, together with the companies that we're working on. Um, but then we're also working on different reports to set out the incentives that we need in order to promote this technology uh, further uh, coming up. And I think this is a solution that is already applicable in Sweden. But of course, the potential is to scale it up internationally as well. And how would you say, how important is this technology to, for Sweden to reach our climate targets and also for EU to reach their climate targets? I think it's important, but um, this solution alone is not more important than other solutions. We need all these solutions we are discussing in the Swedish pavilion in order to reach the goals. So I think it's not one single solution, it's a multiple uh, solution that will, will get us there, for sure. And we've been talking about how we can create and drive incentives and also build this infrastructure and the ecosystem in order to drive and scale. And I wonder how can we then establish a regulatory framework where we combine, can combine both public and private funding? I don't know if you would like to continue this conversation. No, but I think it's important that the government and the agencies, they can support it to some extent. But at some point, the companies and the private sector need to take it uh, further without the government or the agency support. And I think that's also what the private sector wants. Uh, but first, you need a structure. Frederick, please. I, I think many of these projects are, as I said before, high risk, of course, uh, because it's not proven technology yet fully. So having some kind of public funding in a very early stage and then private market comes in and support the longer investment case and, this, and, and scale up. And that's where I think markets can play a role. And I think when it comes to the regulatory framework, it's, it's, it's also about understanding that, that this is it's a huge task. That we, we, today we remove maybe a couple of hundred thousand ton of CO2 from the atmosphere. And IPCC talk about five gigaton. It's not a small step. It's a huge step we're going to take. So how do we do that together? Public, private, companies. Um, so I think in this also, the, the around regulation, we need credibility, but we also need alignment like between legislations or between Europe, US um, and between countries. So it's not an island of many different regulations. Indeed. And, and Anders, would you like to, to compliment on that? How, what, what is your perspective then from being this pioneer in companies? What incentives do you see is needed? Uh, I, I, I fully agree with much what, what, what both of our, my colleagues in this panelist are, are saying now, but I think also that being a forerunner as we are now, we, we are actually aiming to have the first large-scale biocarbon capture and removal facility up and running in 2026. It's a flagship project for Europe, and it's a flagship project for Europe since there will be followers. But being the first, we are trying to handle much of the problems which are Regulation, establishing the voluntary carbon market, how will they interact, how will it be possible to take an investment decision which are more or less one third of our balance sheet and then have the trust that this, this, this will fly. Even if it, the first product will not be super profitable, we need at least to, to secure that we are not spending money which we are just losing. So, so in order to make all this happen, I think we need to speed up a lot around regulation. Uh, we need, uh, for instance, to transport CO2 from Sweden to Norway. Today it is not allowed. Uh, we need to accept that uh, CO2 on a boat is not uh, hazardous waste. Uh, so we need to handle that issue also. And then we need to also have uh, the national framework for, for instance, for reversed auction. Uh, so we can uh, apply for, for that uh, and then on top of that, we need you to have the European and global framework regarding principle of how should this new market for negative emission develop and develop fast enough. But I think then we need to get back one step. The overall goal I think everyone agrees upon. And we also agree upon that this needs to be a system where we are really clear that we have a transparent way of actually storage permanently CO2 that we actually are accountable for, for making that happen. And then the customers which are working on the voluntary car market can rely that this is a certificate and can purchase. But it's, the, the calculation, of course, can only be once. One state can claim for this and one company can claim for it. And I think that's the discussion ongoing now at the moment. And I don't think that's 
I, I think no one wants to have double claiming for two states claiming the same, and not we at all. I think one company can claim it and one nation can claim it. But that's the same with reduction, and that works very well with reduction, so it should be working with negative emission as well. Please, Frederick. Well, I, I think, Anders, I don't think you have to worry about the market. The market will be there. Uh, we, we have built markets before. Uh, it's going to be a global market, uh, absolutely. It's, of course, there is a little bit lack of regulation today. It's a very nascent market. It will take some time to get global regulation, and then markets will, based on that, help you and others uh, to sort of transact it. And I think what... What's needed here is maybe a global body of some kind and hopefully the Integrity Council of Voluntary Carbon Market who comes out with guidelines and principle early next year could be that body. But I think that's what's needed for everyone to start to feel maybe a little bit more secure that they can trust the market. But, but are you not worried at all about the, the double accounting claiming difficulties and, and challenges? I think... I mean, Article 6 are the details. The devils are always in the details. I think we all agree that the sort of the overarching purpose is to maximize impact. We want to remove as much CO2 as we can. We want public funding to help with that, without project to help with that. We want the market to help with that. I don't know enough about Article 6 to be saying it should be like that or that, but I think it has to support the scale up, and, and th that is the overarching purpose. And what kind of trends are you seeing? I mean, you are representing Nasdaq Sweden and uh, Stockholm, and how, what are you, on, as a global company as you are, how, what kind of trends are you seeing globally in terms of the, how you perceive carbon uh, capture uh, globally, and where are the trends? What, where are we in Sweden, in Europe, and, 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 and globally, and what actions need to be done? I mean, to, to reflection, I was on the lunch today w focusing only on carbon removals with representatives from all the world, Africa, US, Europe, Asia, and the focus is very, very high on the agenda, and there is a sense of urgency that we need to move faster because we are approaching 2030 quite fast. So I think a lot of things will happen. We can also look in, in US what happened. They, had, they didn't have that many projects like Anders had. But then they did legislative changes, uh, the, inf the Inflation Reduction Act, 45Q. And after that, it spurred a lot of projects and a lot of activity. So of course, politicians can play a role in creating an infrastructure that, that, that drive uh, sort of innovation and scale up. Niklas, what, what are your view on this from a, from a public perspective and representing the Swedish Energy Agency? I think it's, I agree, and, and we're seeing a lot of changes at the moment. We need to see where they lead. Um, this is for sure something that we will continue to work on. We are about to publish a report uh, in the next year, um, raising some of the uh, solutions that we would like to recommend. So um, I will have to wait the result of that. Could you just elaborate a little bit on, on how you can support in driving the incentives and the scale up from, from of course, a regulatory from framework, but also help the market continue driving the, the, the market and the, the acceleration of negative emissions? Uh, I think it's a hard question to answer straight up, but I think what you mentioned on this, uh, we need to um, test and verify the solutions because that's what allows us to scale it up, both nationally and internationally. And um, at the moment, a lot of people are talking about this, as many people are talking about hydrogen, for instance, but you need to see the proof of concept. And I think seeing is believing, that's something I always say, and I think that goes for, for this case as well. And Anders, what would you think would be the, the largest challenges, but also the benefits uh, when if we can actually get this regulatory framework in, in place? First, let me say, I, I'm quite optimistic that we will, we will be able to actually establish this full-scale facility already in commercial operation 2026. That means that we will need to take an investment decision early 2024. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, and then we'll be a leading uh, CO2 capture and storage in, in Europe. What, what, I, what I can see and, and here is actually that in order to the technology challenges, 
I think we have the know-how. We have, t we have a test facility. It's working perfectly. We are capturing 97% of the CO2. Uh, it works. We, we are working with the transportation. We, we know that there are uh, shipping possibilities to ship the ship. Uh, ship this CO2. We know that the storage are working uh, as we have been collaborating with other countries and, and partners. So, but there's a lot of things which should happen. I think that's maybe the, the largest challenge. And at the same time, we are also uh, working with the voluntary carbon marketing and have a lot of interest from the voluntary carbon market, which are actually willing to purchase this CO2, but they also need to have some kind of security that this will be counted also after five years or after ten years. And I think there is one of the things which we need to solve, and I think it's, it's definitely possible to solve that quite quickly. Uh, and that will give even more speed to the market, and that will also create more private funding into this kind of project, and then also the subsidies which we, we can call which we have received also from the energy agency has actually been working very very well starting up a new industry then it can scale up frederick how do you think we can then avoid that we have too many ways of measuring this and also how we can also ensure that we also avoid the too many different standards um i, I think the most important is that there is a framework for which every standard needs to adhere to. Someone that sets the minimum guidelines, threshold rules for how this should be, and that should of course be based on science. Uh, then within that framework, it's good with many different standards, innovation in new methodology, as you say, it's not all, now we're talking about BEX, but there are other carbon removal methodologies there too, and standards around that. So I think it's not the number of standards, it's the quality of them that is important, and that's why we need this framework. We're running off this first panel, but I would like to ask you, Niklas, what, what is Sweden's role in this, would you say? No, I, I think we do have a very important role, but in the beginning, not at the end. And I think um, that's worth highlighting again. We can help with the financing to get things going, but um, that's our job. And I, I think um, I don't see it expanding further than, than that, to be honest. And of course, the regulatory side to some extent. Frederick, what do you think? Well, uh, I fully agree. I think uh, it is the private market that should then take on uh, and sort of continue to carry the investment, make offtake agreement, create buying signals to all of these projects so they know when Anders makes his investment case, he should know pretty much what the price is and how, what he can calculate with. So I think we need to help driving transparency around price, price formation, and then we, we all need to work together. I think collaboration is the key here to, to really fasten up the process. Please. If I, can, if I can add something, we do have programs in roughly 20 countries around the world where the Swedish Energy Agency is working together with other governments, focusing on either countries or thematic areas. And if this concept works, if we can show the proof of concept, we could also play an important role rolling this out uh, into the world uh, with credibility, Sweden AB, and so on. So I think that's worth mentioning. Indeed. And Anders, we will be joined by a new set of panelists, but I would like to say thank you so much to you, Frederick Ekström, president for Nasdaq Sweden, and also Niklas uh, Karlsson, you're the director of international market development at Energy Agency. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce the next panel. Thank you so much for joining the first one. Um, I would like to welcome up Christian Rönn, the CEO and co-founder of Normative, and Per Lars Hans, you are the director of sustainability at Rangsells, and also Marlene Gilborn, you are head of clean technologies and VP at the energy division at Alfa Laval. And I would actually like to start with you, Per. You are representing a world-leading waste management and recycling company. And we have heard an amazing technology that has been presented by the Stockholm Exergy. I wonder what your view is on a carbon capture markets, but also if you see any other alternatives for, for these kind of concepts. Yes, thank you so much. First, I would like to see directly into the camera and say, mayors around the world, 
Look what Stockholm is doing. Look what the energy company in Stockholm are doing. This is amazing. Make sure that you copy it. So thank you so much, Anders. Yes, there are alternatives. And I hold in my hand one alternative. This is the very first in the world carbon storage of a window frame. It has been produced by using carbon dioxide added with calcium oxide from the ash mountains surrounding Narva. What does it mean? It means that we have produced uh, precipitated calcium carbonates. And this is a, a extremely high quality. But we use two waste streams, CO2 in combination in this with calcium oxide. And I was invited by the French ministry uh, uh, when they ended the EU presidency uh, in June in through Grenoble when they held that INTECH 22 conference, European Commission's conference. And, and after my presentation, the head of science from Tarket, that is a global partner to us, really talked about the high quality and the fantastic solution. And next to me, there was a plastic manufacturer from Netherlands. And he was st stunned and he asked, well, is it as pure as, or is it even better than? And then he talked about a, a conventional producer from limestone, where they dig it up from, from the mine. And he said, Yes, I said, you heard. Yeah, how much can I buy and when? So there are alternatives. And if I would like to talk about Tarket as an example, Tarket are a flooring company that are dedicated to make sure that the floors that you put on your, your, in your houses, in, your, in, in, in hospitals or whatever, they should be taken back and be produced to be a new flooring again. So here we talk about an alternative permanent storage. But the good thing with this, this one, that we are not just storing carbon, we're also reducing a lot of carbon elsewhere. Because the next step, what we'll do in Estonia, is that we'll also produce, be able to produce magnesium. Magnesium today are produced 96% in China by using coal. But here we have the potential with the first factory to produce 30% of the magnesium that Europe needs. So here we talk about huge savings. But we need to do both, or we need to do many more examples. So yes, there are alternatives. Thank you, Pat. And you're also driving the circular agenda quite heavily on rank cells. And I wonder if you also can see how we possibly can include carbon capture and also how we can measure the, our emission within the circular system in another way. Yes, and we are in, not in a circular system yet. And that's, uh, that's uh, the challenge. We are in a linear economy. That means that we have something called scoop one, scoop two, two and scoop three, and that's what we're gonna fulfill. But that's just reducing our problems. What I would like to make sure that we can implement in the future is something called scoop four. Making sure that we can set up innovations that will reduce emissions somewhere else. And when you talk about circularity, and here I would like to address again, not the mayors, but all ministers of environments in the world. If you wanna reduce your environmental budget in your country, make sure that you enable circular solutions. Because the more we mine from our echo loop, from our urban flows, the more you will reduce our environmental impact. Here we talk about the solution that just need market price. So the environmental positive Im Im impact will be enormous. Less water pressure, of course, less CO2 emissions. And, uh, uh, and ex one example is that the amount of limestone that we can uh, mine by adding CO2 into the calcium oxide is 200 years of limestone mining on the, on the island of Gotland in Sweden. 200 years. Thank you so much, Pat. And Madeleine, I would like to turn to you. How can we ensure a more cost-efficient carbon capture process? Yes. So when we look at carbon capture, uh, if first of all, what is Alpha Laval in this, right? So we are the world leading producer in heat transfer technology. So we support our customers to save energy. So we utilize the energy we produce in the most efficient way. So every year we support our customers to save 100 gigawatt of energy. So carbon capture is also a very energy intense process. And we have to make sure that the, the carbon we capture are we doing in the most efficient way. 
So for example, uh, we know that we can support the customers to reduce the energy need by 40%. It's both to make sure that we use the right technology, but it's also about sector coupling. So we have to make sure that we utilize the heat or the waste streams of energy that is available in the existing processes, whether that is steel, whether that is biomass, or wherever we are. So we have a system thinking approach in the way we utilize the energy. Thank you so much. And how would you also think that we can accelerate the deployment of carbon capture technologies? Yes. So first of all, I think we have to realize that carbon capture is, we are talking here about carbon removal, but carbon capture is also a lot of different technologies. And carbon capture is not new in that sense. It's been around for decades, but it has never really taken off. So for it to take off this time, we also have to make sure this becomes a business. It has to have revenues, it has to become a proper business. It cannot just rely on policies and subsidies. And I think we said many very good things in this panel, but I would like to add one part to it, and that is that we take a system thinking approach, that we think about the complete value chain. Because now we talk about the cost of capturing it, but we have to think about the cost of transport and the cost of storage. And only by looking at the complete value chain, that is how we can sort of unlock this uh, sort of cost to come down. And, I, and we were talking about it before, but I mean, the key here is new collaborations and partnerships. Thank you very much, Madeleine. And with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Christian. You're often talking about and highlighting the importance of quality and also integration in, uh, in carbon removal projects. And of course, also the importance that we do not only reduce CO2 emissions uh, first, but also how we can advance the carbon removal market. So I wonder what is really the link in between the carbon accounting that you are working with at Normative, you are an accounting, a carbon accounting uh, consultancy agency, but also how do you then see the link in between carbon accounting and also carbon removal? What a great question. So I'm going to try to link here what we have talked about so far with the topic of carbon accounting. So we help large businesses at Normative to account for their full carbon footprint, including their value chain. And, and the way I see it that it links is that, you know, you have amazing solutions for removing carbon emissions from the atmosphere. Those solutions need to be scaled up. In order for that to happen, to Frederick Tong points before, we need markets, we need capital. Uh, but in order for any market to function properly, you need some sort of accounting. Look at financial markets today. The only reason that they exist is because of the invention of double entry bookkeeping and accounting. You have comparable P&Ls between legal entities. So investors can essentially look at companies in a comparable way. And we need the same thing for carbon emissions accounting. And we need it in two ways, right? So. Often what is happening right now is that businesses release a bunch of carbon emissions that they need to reduce. Uh, and they need to reduce it both in their own operations, but also in their, their value chain, uh, their, their scope three. And then there will be always be a residual that they can't reduce, which is uh, where, where you need some sort of removal. Uh, but we often talk about the multiplicatives between the you know, accounting standards for you know, setting the carbon baseline on what you need to reduce, but also having the right accounting standards for the removals themselves, namely the ton year accounting. So to give a clear example, today we have several companies with kind of carbon neutral targets. And we see this over and over again that there is an accuracy gap. So companies don't account for their full carbon footprint uh, and uh, in, in, in general they omit their scope 3 emissions. So you have a lot of businesses today that only account for 10% of their carbon emissions and then they might invest in um, projects that make similar claims to what your projects are doing. They might uh, invest in planting trees, for instance. Uh, but there's a huge difference between, you know, taking, removing carbon from the atmosphere and it's staying uh, uh, under the ground for tens of thousands of years to planting a tree where it will maybe stay up for 20 years. So, so we really need accounting both, uh, standardized accounting uh, for the removals. We also need it to set the right baseline for companies. So in the end of the day, we have companies today 
today that uh, might uh, only actually remove uh, 0.1% of their total emissions because they have the wrong baseline and they invest in the wrong uh, things in, in order to reduce emissions. So that was a bit of a long spiel of how uh, accounting fits into it all, but yeah. I'm also wondering how can we possibly then also make more data-driven decisions and how can we make more fact-based based decision? I mean, how do we know how much to buy, but also the accountability and, in, and also the integrity of those removals? Uh, you need to look at a couple of factors, right? So, I mean, one is permanence. If I release carbon emissions, that emission will stay up there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, to just uh, invest in something where it will stay, you know, for 20 years is, is not enough. So, the permanence is really a factor. And there you should think about it in, in ton years, really. Um, but then there is also the question of additionality, uh, like, okay, if I make this investment into some sort of project, would that project have happened otherwise if it wasn't for, for that investment? And then especially in the kind of more carbon, not, not removals, but carbon offsets through forestry, there's the problem of leakage. I might, uh, you know, uh, protect a piece of forest somewhere uh, and then the same landowner is, is cutting it down some, someplace else. Uh, so there's several of those things that you need to look at, at a, to have a kind of you know, unified framework uh, for, for accounting for uh, removals and, and, and offsets because right now people are confused on the market and a lot of people might think they can spend you know, uh, one to three dollars per ton to remove carbon emissions it's, and it's because they don't understand the, the uh, fundamentals. Thank you, Christian. And what, what are your views on, on this, Anders? On the last part? Yeah. Uh, of course, I think it's, it's important to, uh, to understand the permanence of, a, of an action. Uh, if I, if, and, and I think they're, they're the permanent storage which we're talking about and are aiming for now. That, of course, you can tell that that's on the, the right-hand side. That will be permanent store that will take away and remove uh, CO2 for, for uh, ever. And then you have solutions which are, are also important, but they will maybe just take away CO2 for a, for a shorter period. Then it will be emitted again. But, but I think we need to have possibilities to do both of them, these, or all of these, in order to reach uh, the Paris Agreement. So, so I also can see, if I comment a little bit on, on what was Per and, and, uh, and your, my ladies on the side, he'll say it's, uh, it's definitely so that carbon, carbon and energy, are the vital part for all life, more or less. So we can utilize carbon if we have captured it also in other processes. Of course we can, and we should do that also. And I think that is also promising. And the more we have this kind of alternative, the more project of carbon capture can also be realized. So, so I, I, I think this gives also possibility. And if I look what we are aiming for as a forerunner, I, I could be scared when I hear, listen to how we should increase the efficiency and things like that. But I think we have been thinking about the whole value chain. When we are looking at our project, we actually are increasing the efficiency. We are taking more heat out of the process and we increase actually, we are not utilizing more biomass than before. So I think the whole value chain thinking is needed to be there. And then there will be alternative for next project, which I hope will be pretty soon in our operation, then we maybe are going for utilizing it to produce products instead. Absolutely, and I'm also thinking, we're talking about a little bit about then the infrastructure, the regulations, the incentives and so forth, but I'm also having a question regarding the pricing. I mean, the, car, the price of both carbon capture, of course, but also the permanent storage that, that you are providing. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, th I think uh, you have, uh, many of you have been traveling to uh, COP27 and many of you have maybe also climate compensated your journey to this place and you can see that there are offsets which cost 100 Swedish crowns or 10 dollars or there are other ways which are cost maybe 1000 uh, or 100 dollars and I think this also will go for, for uh, the removal in the end. There will be different parts invest in or which you can purchase and they will be different prices. Uh, I, I guess that's the way the market will develop. But I don't think that is the most important when we are starting. I think the most important now is that we rapidly 
make sure that this will be a market we need to have removal and we need to start immediately that happen yeah, we have had several pioneering examples and, and technologies and, and methodologies being presented here and and we're currently at, at cop 27 and i wonder what each of, of you are, are thinking in terms of what we what would be the key messages but also the needs that that you would like to require from the decision decision makers here at the cop 27 well in our case when it comes to their project in estonia we need to make sure that we can have access to carbon dioxide and that is our biggest challenge otherwise i would say that collaboration with society with other companies will be key and i'm not surprised to say that that uh, one of the collaborators in the osa project are also alpha laval so uh, reaching out to others and uh, make sure that we have possibilities to do things together and if i can address something i would say, like to say that we are now looking for partners for the magnesium project so if there are anyone seeing this um, please contact us and make sure that you are you will be brought in like like alpha laval Thank you, Per. So uh, I would go like more on the policy side here. So I would say, uh, from our perspective, we see, if I can get one wish, it's about getting a long-term and transparent plan in place. Uh, because that will de-risk the investments and incentivize us as business to dare to take some of the decisions, right? Uh, and when you do so, do not just think about the capture of the carbon. Think about also the infrastructure and the storage part when we do the incentives plans. Thank you, Madeleine. Christian. Um, my final words would be we need uh, proper accounting to have uh, uh, functional markets and I totally agree we need many different approaches uh, but if we can find the right accounting procedures to compare them because we all want to remove carbon emissions uh, we can figure out where we can get the best bang for the buck uh, in the end. Yeah. Thank you. Anders what are, what are your perspective? What well, I would like to add, maybe, I, I agree with what my panelists are, are saying, but I think that there are now time for the politicians to set the, the framework for uh, Article 6 that will help a lot, and that will support nations, and that will support market. And I, I'm real optimistic when I listen to, uh, for instance, Frederick from Nasdaq, that there are a market. There is a growing market, which we also can clearly see. And I think the urgency, which we can also hear from other nations, that is also something which I bring with me, because that also gives me more motivation to actually accelerate what we are doing in order to set up this new industry, which I think is so crucial and can give so many new jobs and also create social benefits for so many people. Uh, I definitely uh, think that is a very great ending. I would just see that I see that Pad, you were presenting a little uh, powder, and Madeleine, you presented this fossil-free heat exchanger, and you have something here as well. What is this? Yeah, this is uh, actually uh, cl clear only CO2 in this bottle. So uh, this is what we have taken out from our test facility, which has been running for three years now, and we can uh, actually see that this is pure CO2, which we have compromised in this bottle. Impressive. And I think that also is showcasing that these innovations are here today. The technologies are here today. So with that, I would need to, unfortunately, close this discussion. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you for everyone who tuned in, both virtually and also participated here in the pavilion. Um, we have today been discussing the importance of the market framework for negative emissions and, and also the, the importance of cost-efficient carbon processes and we are more than happy to have you all here today and we hope that you will tune in for our next sessions where we will continue discussing policies innovations and finance needed to accelerate the green transition and to pioneer the possible thank you so much for today thank you
So I would like that you all introduce yourself and a bit of a take. Who is responsible for this? Is it the individual or in industry? Or should we play it in turn? So how do you, how do you look upon it? Please. I'll, I'll go first then. Uh, I'm uh, as head of sustainability and CSO of Alfa Laval. Uh, I think that we are, it's both. But I'll get to that. But first of all, Alpha Laval, we are a technology leader within our core technologies, heat transfer, uh, within separation and fluid handling. And those are very much behind the scene processes that you rely on every day, like for clean water, food and energy. Uh, and my, t my thought on that, your question is that you can't separate them. There's a need in my mind uh, for a huge systemic shift and we as an industry leader are very much responsible together with our partners to contribute to that. And, uh, but I also see that we, all those that drive that transition are individuals. And when I talk to our uh, employees, those that are committed on a personal level are aiming service uh, with the global reach. So we have 450 million users and that is really our kind of leverage and how we can drive change. And I really want to kind of tag on to what you were saying because I think sometimes you get lost in this individual versus systemic change um, and that we still think it's kind of polarized. And I think we can, uh, when we talk about individual action, it becomes too small and too kind of not impactful. You end up in kind of, should you recycle or not? And yes, you should, but that's not going to make the biggest difference. And sometimes also systemic change can be feel too, too big to, to um, uh, have an influence on. So to combine those and to your point I mean where is your where do your power lie where what is your superpower and how can you use that to drive change both as an individual uh, maybe not recycling but what you do at work as you said we being committed or you're as a voter you're as, you're as uh, in the society how can you drive change there and as companies not only focusing and of course we should all kind of limit our negative impact but as importantly how do we make sure that we use our superpowers to maximize our positive impact Impact. So really about finding that kind of golden circle, where can we have impact, where do we have power, uh, and that kind of intersection between individual and more systemic change. So both. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to add after all of these great perspectives. Uh, I think uh, I can reaffirm some of the uh, thoughts that you've shared. I'm Molly Birch, I'm Head of Global Sustainability Innovation at MasterCard. And uh, of course I could talk about the first in the payments industry having science-based target initiative approved uh, carbon reduction targets or the way in which we mobilize 3 billion people across a network of 22,000 banks. But I think for me as an individual sharing my answer, I'm more leaning actually towards you, Abba, in terms of the, all the roles that we have as individuals. And depending on where we are in the world, where we are in our life stages, but really using all of those roles as sisters, mothers, daughters, voters, leaders, co-workers, citizens, uh, consumers. I mean, there are so many roles that we have and there are so many decisions we take, big and small, every day. And it's in that we can drive and inspire and bring followership, um, both as both bring individual followership, but also industry followership, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much for those lovely introductions and perspectives to start with. And you all represent very innovative companies that comes up with new innovations all the time and have a lot of processes in, in place to do that. How, how do you see and could you provide an example of an innovation or innovative system that actually catalyzes climate action? Yes, uh, I'll start then. Uh, we have at the core, as you say, innovation. and. Uh, there are many, many different ones, and many are also, most of them are within partnerships. Like Ea said, we are partners. Uh, we drive innovation together with Tetapak. But to be very specific, we have, for example, within the clean tech uh, industry and the energy transformation, we drive uh, the innovation of fuel cells or liquid wind is a partnership where we together create uh, the possibility to 
uh, get e-methanol through the market. Uh, and we have in the marine sector a partnership with Valenius to get Ocean Bird, we call it, uh, on the seas, which is driven by marine vessels driven by wind propulsion that brings down the carbon emissions by 90%. We have in the food sector that we work with, we innovate together with others for Beeler, for example, plant-based food. We reduce the water uh, in beer, uh, making it much easier uh, to transport, like 60% reducing uh, the carbon emissions on that, uh, but having the same taste. So I can just go on <laughs> like this because it's in everything we do. And I think... Uh, it really is together also with the partners that we have that is the key to our success. Um, Can I ask a follow-up? Just how, how did you start? I mean, when did you start to have this as a, such an integrated part? I, sh I should say that it probably started when Tetra Pak was kind of uh, still the owner of Alpha Laval, right? <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> Please Should just a joke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, w it is in our DNA, actually, uh, because we are very many, uh, most oftenly behind the scene in those processes that I mentioned, and we've always p had to drive to get our customers together in partnerships to make things work better, to reduce co total cost of ownership make processes more efficient, etc. It's now that we see great elevation of that, those partnerships, and really want to do more, uh, also on long-term commitments together with the partners that we have. So I think it's way back, and we've been innovating for the past almost 140 years. Thank you. Molin. I wanted to build on something that Anna shared in terms of actually going also beyond the industry that you're in. I think that there are so many ways in which you, with your capacity, can influence and inspire and build uh, new standards or drive new initiatives even far beyond your industry. Um, one example of that is um, with our Sustainability Innovation Lab in Sweden, we collaborate a lot with government agencies and with cities. And Umeå, as one of the net zero um, um, EU um, cities for 2030, they worked with us this year actually to look at spending data for, from tourists coming into Umeå and for the first time, thanks to our collaboration with the economy, combining that with environmental impact of that spend. And this meant that for the first time in history, some teams in their organization or in the, in the city could come together around a very different agenda. You could see the tourism uh, team that is measured around growing tourism GDP, meeting the um, climate team from the city measured on the net zero 2030 pathway to start to talk about different things in terms of how do we drive a decarbonized tourism or you know what are the things we need to do for the events that we have for tourists that leads us towards a pathway for net zero. And I think in, in this capacity, what we at MasterCard did was just to do what we've done for... I haven't heard about the kind of opportunities that we all have. And I think that needs to be um, much more clear because it's also so much more fun. And it creates incentivized kind of how can we do this as a business? How can we grow our businesses with the help of this and also add value in the world? Absolutely. I, I think thinking, thinking out of the box in terms of the solutions and industry collaboration is something really to consider. Um, and one, one thing that just came to, to, came to my mind, uh, you know, of course, we have a lot of uh, innovation stories uh, from the technology or solutions perspective in, in, you know, in the food systems, how to reduce food waste or food loss or come up with uh, alternative proteins, uh, which will replace animal proteins. But one very simple thing is that, you know, we are one of the world's uh, largest uh, packaging companies. And even, even if it was not really intended, we do have some packages here as, uh, as well. Uh, and and if, you, if you kind of uh, revisit our package, you see that there's a lot of real estate uh, in the package. So the package can speak to you. And as a consumer, it can actually provide you guidance and ideas of what you can do. And with different type of um, intelligent packaging with RFIDs, etc., you can actually be a driver for change and just uh, you know, connect to... Uh, from, uh, from the package to, to your Spotify channel where you link into the MasterCard which is going to help you then 
connect to I don't know what at Alpha Laval. But that's a, that's the kind of chains of action that we could be innovating on. And I think we're maybe sometimes too constrained in our thinkings uh, of, of how to do that. But Eya, I, Eya, I actually have a follow-up question for you on that. So when you think about the amazing um, front end that you have with your packaging that is just before a choice of consumption in, in many occasions, um, we also see that we have now, I think, over 430 various sustainability um, brands or, you know, symbols that symbolizes this is a sustainable choice, but it's a jungle for consumers to understand all of these uh, sustainability measurements or standards. What would be your call to action, you know, as, as you are the communicator, you have the platform of communication to the consumers in that sense. Um, how do you think about that uh, to, to give something that consumers understand and can relate to? Yeah, I think that's a million dollar question and, and uh, thankfully the regulators are thinking about it. So I think in terms of the, the, the labeling and, and, and the green claims and, and all of that, I mean, at least in Europe, it's, it's going to be regulated because it's been a minefield. Uh, but it, it's, um, I mean, actually, obviously, uh, we can influence as a company who provides the material and, and who, who kind of uh, creates the packages for the customers. We can influence uh, to a certain extent, but ultimately it is the company who, who packages the product uh, and, and who decides uh, what, the, what the claims are. But I think this unification and simplification, uh, I mean, that really, the, it's really needed for, for the consumer to do, be able to make the, the right choices. And just on that note, I think we need to again to think uh, very holistic uh, as we are then part of making the process happen and can really make it more sustainable, then it's going to be easier for the consumer to not have to pick between thousands of uh, more or less unsustainable choices, but really trying to find those processes together with you, you, Tietabak, for example, to make everything more sustainable instead because I think it's going to be impossible I think it's impossible myself to try to figure out what should I pick to make the most sustainable choice yeah and I maybe maybe on that so so one thing that we we have a tetra pack which is maybe many many people don't know know but uh, so we actually help uh, customers design the food. So we have food design centers, so we call them development centers. So if you, uh, as, a, as a customer, if you want to, for instance, to, to move from uh, dairy to plant-based, or if you have a certain uh, uh, footprint in your current product and you want to reduce that, or you want less sugar, different nutritional things, uh, they, they can jo uh, join us uh, and develop, uh, co-develop that. And I think this, uh, this kind of making the right choices, of course, you know, CO2 uh, in terms of what is in the package, much uh, of the, the, the CO2 is actually in the, in the substance in there, not in the package itself. So in, when you start thinking of these labels and how to instruct your, your, um, your customers or how to make the right choices, it's a chain effect where you have to think of many, many things, uh, not just the surface, uh, also the content. So that's important, of course. And I think, sorry, we're stealing your show here. What, <laughs> Katarina? You're just, you're out of work. <laughs> Do you want to add something? Listening and then being impressed by these really, really innovative business leaders, which, which calls for my next question then. <laughs> I'm just enjoying uh, the ride. Uh, but also, uh, I mean, you, you all represent, represent these innovative companies companies, but you are also very innovative leaders uh, and with a great foresight. So I would be curious, it must be so that you sometimes look at another industry and get ideas on how could they make that shift. Are there any industrial shifts that you have recognized in other industries, be it private or public? Uh, that you would want to see or wish to see to make to make climate action happen on a systemic level? I mean, I could start a bit closer to home in terms of um, how have we learned from other processes of cross-industrial um, or cross-industry collaboration or cross-societal collaboration. And that started actually, the, the case I'm referring to now started in 2015 where our CEO at the time, RJ Banga, went into a World Bank IMF meeting and talked about the two billion people not having access to 
um, bank account or financial, digital financial tools. And basically what he did was to put his hand up in the air and say, we at MasterCard, we commit to bring 500 million people into the digital economy by 2025. Was it MasterCard meeting that objective by 2020 and doubling it towards 25 with a billion? No, it was our collaboration with governments, with merchants, with banks, with NGOs, civil society. And as a catalyst in order to drive the new solutioning of that, the, we, together with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, opened a financial inclusion lab in Nairobi, in Kenya. And now when we approach what could be MasterCard's role in the climate transition, we do the same. We repeat that kind of setup in terms of creating a collaboration innovation platform with the Sustainability Innovation Lab based in Sweden because we see the business leadership, we see the government leadership hopefully continuing, we see the citizen maturity, consumer maturity in a very different way. So more perhaps learning from our own history, um, tackling another global challenge than looking at other industries, but really keen to hear uh, from the other panelists on examples. Well, one, one obvious thing is, of course, well, there's a lot to learn from the financial sector, actually, in terms of what, how to incentivize certain, certain changes. And I'd uh, also like to credit the, the, basically the IT sector, which obviously digitalization and industry 4.0 is totally critical for us. So if we look into, into, you know, you can drive change when you have the information and you have transparency of where the loss is or where the challenges are in the, let's say, in the processing uh, of, uh, of food, for instance. So, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of things that we can learn, but we can also collaborate. And I think uh, when, when you look into, when you're in the B2B business and you look into B2C companies, oh my God, it's a different ball game. And, and there's, uh, there's um, the opportunities to leverage some of those uh, again incentivizing and how to attract things and, and how to drive change in, in, a, in a kind of a different ways uh, through, uh, through communication for instance uh, there's a lot to learn for, uh, for the B2B companies. I was just thinking also about our history I mean turning the music industry from like a plastic based CD to going totally digital I mean that could have been the kind of the biggest environmental project but of course it wasn't driven by environmental footprint but it was I mean had a really great effect and I think that that is the mindset we have to take with us I mean it, the biggest shifts are not going to happen because it's it's nice or it's good it's going to happen because it's good business uh, and of course I mean there's there's way of doing it as a good business both when it comes to real business opportunities but of course also regulation, incentives and things like that. So I think it's really interesting to look at this like historical shifts. So what made them happen? Uh, and looking at other kind of societal changes, what made them happen? How many people did you need to have with you to, to achieve this change? And then kind of apply that for, for now. Actually, a question about your CO2 calculation. So when you, when you kind of look into your footprint, can you take the avoided emissions of all those CDs uh, in your calculations? <laughs> we, we talked about it a few years ago, but I think it's kind of obsolete now, right? I mean, it's not, it's not relevant, but it's, it's an interesting thought. It, it is indeed. Uh, it is interesting. Yeah, and if I should just uh, then add on that, I think uh, for us, or if I should pick one uh, specific uh, learning, it's within IT. Uh, I mean, data is power and knowledge, and we need the data to really drive the innovation across everything we do. But I also think that we have one unique position that we are across, I think, most industries. So we learn from one industry and then we can take that learning to another one. Uh, and that's what happens over and over again. And if we look upon uh, what is said to be, I mean, a very tiny window of opportunity, if we look at the opportunities, we need to speed up our actions. What, what kind of priorities do you see? What, kind, what, what is it that we need to accelerate? But I think your initiative at Spotify is interesting in terms of the proximity of the crisis. Um, can, you, can you share a little bit? Because I think that's I so think, interesting. I, think I mean, looking at the pandemic, the proximity of the crisis led to a totally different behavior across governments uh, yes. and the society. Yeah. Um, so, you know, 
we who live in the northern uh, part of the world, we who are rich, we who are creating the problem, we are not paying the price, but we need to have the proximity of the crisis in order to be able to change our behavior. And you have some explorations Some ideas that. of how to do that. Uh, and that's because th we're think thinking about this like window of opportunity, right, that it's closing. Uh, and we need, to, I mean, this sense of urgency, but we're not really feeling it, right? So when we, we started to kind of uh, discover how we could use content to drive kind of climate action. Uh, our first thought was always like, let's science. We need to communicate science. We need to have the scientists on the platform. And now we have Johan Rockström in the podcast studio. So we're, we haven't left that, that thought at all. But, but then we kind of thought at another time and said, okay, is it really that's the problem? Is it facts that are missing? And then we said, no, I mean, most people know the facts. But we're not acting. I'm not li living like a perfect climate life, although I, I work with this and I know the facts. And why are we not acting? I mean, we think that it's because we don't feel it enough. It's not close to our hearts. And to Malin's point, I mean, some people, of course, a lot of people in the world are already living with this very close. Um, but we can't wait until everyone has it really, really close. So what we did was to kind of, how can we kind of make people feel this? So we did audio short stories based on science and based on future scenarios of what the world can look like in 50 years um, to create this kind of, uh, how can we see the different possible futures and how can we make people feel that they have the power to choose what future we will end up in. So I think that's, that's one way of doing it. And I think that could also be connected to what we've talked about, kind of how do we make it mainstream? How do we not create products that are sustainable products, but how do we integrate it into every kind of offering that we have? And here it's not about climate, it's about stories. It's, it's about not listening to a really exciting story, and then you're gonna get that kind of climate vision or climate scenario on top of it. And integrating, for us it's integrating it into other types of content, and in other areas of course it's making every product, product sustainable and not having that as a separate offer. I, I, could I could actually invite B2B companies to explore this. Uh, we have done that as well. So in terms of how we see our role on the, on the sustainability transition, it's about activating our network. MasterCard's network has no value if the 22,000 banks doesn't start to prioritize differently in what they equip their business customers and retail bank customers with. So what we do, either in a virtual way or for those who visit us uh, with the Sustainability Lab in Stockholm, we give them short stories about uh, how the world might be in 30 to 50 years from now and working with backcasting. And in terms of emotional connections there, it's about business leaders, bank CEOs, feeling uh, what's in those stories uh, so they can then work with different um, strategy work and you know roadmap creation etc for the evolution of their offering so I would invite you to explore it yeah one, one thing which is always uh, kind of interesting to think uh, when you when you look into the theory of change and and whether it's uh, top down or whether it's bottom up like in in companies and, and all that and I had the opportunity to work for the UN uh, for, for five years and, and, uh, and I was uh, coming from the private sector and I left for the private sector. Uh, but in essence, uh, uh, what was really stunning was that, you know, there were, there were uh, many, many people at the UN, they were working really hard and, and they had their theories of change and they were, they were kind of pushing for things, working with the governments and, and being patient. And then I had the opportunity to work at UNICEF where we had these ambassadors and you put one football pay from Barcelona to go uh, uh, to the social media and say you guys need to do that and it happens so also understanding the theory of change uh, is is uh, is really I think that's that's really core and I actually wanted to ask your opinions because I know that you're a change uh, expert uh. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to fill in on that because it's exactly what I see would very much uh, accelerate things. Uh, there's so many, everyone in my mind wants to contribute, but how do you contribute? It's been in my mind very much a corporate uh, discussion on sustainability in many of our customers and maybe also our own organization. But how do you bring it down in each and every level so you can feel a part of the journey to make the feelings <laughs> come out and make yourself proud of being a part of a really super interesting uh, journey towards making this transition happen? And that's what we're doing uh, at Alpha Val at the moment. And that's about very basic things, but you need to visualize our 
targets. You need to have the targets on each and every level. You need to be empowered to make the change. Uh, you need to have the culture to be able to make mistakes also, because this is really a hard and challenging journey we're on. And that's within leadership. So it, it's really big, but also easy to take a couple of first steps, I think to make everybody feel a part. And it also goes with our customers, because if you talk about how, why, I usually say that we have such a potential here and now to drive energy efficiency. It would bring down carbon emissions on a global level by 2.5%. Why don't we do it? Well, one piece of that puzzle might be that we're not aware of the potential. So what can we do? Well, we can, uh, talk about ourselves as energy hunters and visualize what's possible for every industry owner and leader and then make change happen. Because if you see the possibilities of payback being very short, almost nothing, and then saving energy, saving carbon emissions, then you're on. <laughs> wow. And very maybe, maybe just bridging on that, uh, uh, also the... the Sad, sad truth is that you need regulation. Uh, so, so uh, when when you are when you are in business and when you really want to drive change uh, uh, across the industries or across the value chain, it is uh, regulation that is uh, that is a great driver. And I must say that uh, as a, as an individual and as a representative of Tetra Pak, I mean we really appreciate the EU's uh, efforts uh, to drive change. I think we have a lot of uh, challenging situations now with uh, food security and energy crisis, the conflict and all that. But my God, they've tried to. Uh, drive change and uh, the European Parliament also, which is a bit the people, people with, their, with their individuals as well, uh, driving change. And I think it's great to see that the EU has been a forerunner in, in, in many ways, but uh, it does help to have regulation. And then I would say, and the cost on carbon wouldn't hurt. <laughs> or a price on carbon, because then every transaction with a MasterCard would very simply explain the logic with your purchasing decision. And, and I, I agree, just that we need a harmonized international <laughs> uh, tax or rules. Uh, that's the tricky one, but yes, and transparent and fair for everyone. We are getting close to summarize this conversation and I would like to ask you a couple of questions um, that I was inspired by you both before this session but also now uh, and I'm thinking the demands of leadership has that changed what what kind of leadership is required to to actually overcome this challenge and also how would you each individually or with your with your business what is your commitment what what action will you take from here from today and on so of course uh, it's maybe maybe easy to work for a family owned company or or privately owned company i mean that makes certain things uh, a lot easier having worked in the in the sort of uh, on the other side of the the private sector for a long time uh, sometimes uh, Sometimes, um, you know, I'd, I'd say that uh, investors play a key role in, in influencing companies. But in terms of leadership, I think today's leaders uh, um, are are they are born uh, change makers. Uh, and you you are not going to make it otherwise. And I think in in our company, we're really lucky to have a very strong and, and very kind of a driven uh, CEO who is driving it and uh, my manager who is actually the, the chief sustainability officer he, he keeps on his his motto is always that be the change that you want to see the, in the world so the Gandhi, Gandhi motto so I think that inspires us uh, us all but uh, we were talking about the individual kind of commitments that we were all going to make here today um, and I haven't quite sort of um, come up with one yet so so I'll, I'll leave it for afterwards uh, I'm not going to become vegan uh, on stage today okay I can, I can connect to that and I think we need leaders who apply their disruptive mindset from business and apply that to climate and I think if we do that if we have that kind of changing industry mindset disruptive way of thinking uh, we can fix this yes and I would say we need brave leaders uh, that is so important to be brave and to uh, give others your employees 
the possibility to shine because it's not you as the leader is going to do it. It's all your employees. And and you need to be the facilitator of change and just walk the talk. Uh, and in my case, we are committed to carbon neutral. We have the net zero with science-based target initiative. Uh, and that goes back to myself because I'm also part of that system as an individual. And then I, I'm committed to uh, reduce my uh, traveling, for example, because that goes directly into also my company's footprint uh, and use the digital tools, for example. That's just one of the examples. But I think uh, it goes on all levels, waste and my own consumption as well, for example. Thank you. Um, and Anna, the, the, the bravery in the leadership, I think, is a really good kind of core capability in a way, because for me, um, the modern leadership and what we need now is about inclusion, it's about going beyond your industry, it's about um, being that steward um, and really look at what is the collective uh, positive impact for this ecosystem of uh, organizations, private, public, um, big or small, and really looking. I think the World Economic Forum actually has a very interesting model with the forum way, and they've worked with uh, tackling big global challenges for a long time um, across sectors, across type of companies, across geographies. And I think that has fostered a leadership which I think actually is emerging into uh, what type of leadership we need today. Um, Okay, individual commitment. I think I'm one month into my role as leading MasterCard Sustainability Innovation Lab, um, and we have an opportunity to enable three billion people to make sustainable consumption choices. That's a job that won't take a week, a quarter, a year. I'm fully committed to, to do that and, and to really try to have an inclusive leadership and bring um, competitors, um, various type of organizations, uh, startups and governments on board on that journey. Uh, so that's what I'm committed to, a small one. That takes like 40, 40 plus hours of your week, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much. A big hand to our panel. Thank you.
So, welcome to this session around science and fiction, where we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of storytelling to actually make sure that we uh, reach our climate targets in time. So we have an amazing panel here, but I'll wait a little bit with introducing uh, them to you, because first we're actually going to start off in a little bit different way. So if you have the opportunity, I'd love for you to just, you know, take a comfortable chair, sit down, close your eyes, and then we're going to listen to the Spotify original 2072, which is a podcast where we really have combined science, but made it in a story. So this episode is written by Tuva Nuvotny, uh, or uh, uh, Henry Bjorn. Uh, it is read up by actress Gizem Erdogan, and uh, then it's based on the science by Andrew Mary. So you'll listen now to a short clip of that one, and then we'll dive into the session. So, take a seat, close your eyes, and listen. The heat that hit us was stupefying. The air trembled, and it was hard to focus my eyes at first. I stumbled out and had a hard time taking in the nightmarish sight. We came out in the middle of a square, in a city. Or rather, what once was a city. Despite the heat, everything was covered in grey snow swirling around and making it difficult to see. Grandpa seemed to understand what I was thinking. It's ash, he said. The forests on the other side of the barrier never stop burning. A couple of delicate gray flakes landed on my jacket, and when I brushed them off, they turned into a small black charcoal stain on the fabric. The sun was high in the sky, which was tinged with an unnatural orange glow. It's the soot particles that makes the sky change color, Grandpa explained. It's not blue here, like at home. It had been ages since anyone had lived in this town. The houses were abandoned and covered in soot. Lots of houses and cars had burned and the asphalt had melted, creating deep craters in the streets. To my right, a large lift of some kind had collapsed and was almost covered by the gray ash. In front of me, there was a low building with stairs that disappeared underground. The large windows cracked by the heat. A half-melted sign despite a blue tea hung at the entrance. We walked across the square, past burned car wrecks and metal twisted by the heat. Then I saw the water. It was nasty green from the seaweed and stood several meters too high judging by some old cranes that had broke the surface like a forest of rusty metal. An acrid, rancid smell from the Dead Sea hit us. Across the gulf, I could make out poles and towers, like something out of an evil fairy tale. Grandpa saw where I was looking. That's Granalun Fun Fair. The green grove, he said. Pretty ironic in retrospect, he added. The heat hung over us like a quivering lid, but we kept walking. Grandpa leading the way and me close behind, down towards a golden-colored bridge. I remember thinking that there was something familiar about this place, even though it was impossible. Everything around us was dead. There were no people, no animals, no plants, just a dry, burnt desert town. I was about to burst into tears. Grandpa noticed. I'm sorry to have to show you all this, Liv, but it's necessary, he said. We came to an alley with old cobblestones. The buildings here look different. Everything felt old. Grandpa looked at me. We have to hurry. They are waiting. I didn't understand what he was talking about, but he pushed me forward before I could object. We came out into a large square, where the ashes had blown together into a great black heaps that clung to the facades of the old buildings and in through the windows, as if the building were being swallowed by black lava. And suddenly, I saw what he meant. A group of people stood in a circle in the square. They were all wrapped in shawls and wearing face masks, and looked as lost as I felt. When we got closer, I saw that they were no adults. They were all children of my own age, over 20 of them. As far as I could remember, I had never seen another child. 
I looked at him quizzically. Who are they? Grandpa took my hands and looked me straight in the eye. They're the people who will decide the future. You don't know it yet, but you are one of them too. Go over there and listen. Tell them what you learn and what we experience together. Grandpa let go of my hands and gave me a hug. Remember one thing. It's never brave to pretend that danger doesn't exist. Bravery is when you see the danger, but overcome it anyway. When you do what's needed, no matter how difficult or dangerous. There was something about those words I liked. So be brave now, Liv. The bravest you ever been, he whispered. I didn't want to let go, but... So, uh, open your eyes if you have closed them. Um, that was a little bit part, uh, a part of that episode. If you want to listen to the full one and also two other ones, we have them available. And I can really recommend also then to listen with your headphones on so you get the 8D sound. So, uh, now I want to introduce uh, the panel. And we have some panelists being here on stage uh, from COP and also virtually. Uh, so I'll start with you, Ebba, here, that are next to me. Can you please introduce yourself, and then I'll let the other ones introduce themselves as well. Sustainability at Spotify. Ebba Grithberg, Head of Sustainability at Spotify, if you missed that. Um, so I've been working with these um, scenarios, for example, together with Andrew, who we'll meet soon. And this is one way of us, for us of exploring how we can drive positive change in the world. We're a company, so of course we have to take care of our own emissions, but rather we have a huge opportunity in kind of using our platform. And we will discuss more of how to do it, but this is one way that we have, have done this so far. And I'm going to see if uh, Emma and Andrew, I can't see you, um, but now, perfect. Welcome to COP here as well. So happy to have you. And we are a very global team as well. Emma, do you want to tell us uh, who you are and where you're calling from? Sure. Hello, everyone. Emma Stewart calling in from California. I'm normally based in San Francisco, but today in Hollywood. Uh, and I lead sustainability for Netflix, and I'm delighted to be beaming in to this session at COP. Thank you. Welcome. And Andrew, you're joining us from Stockholm, right? This feels like Eurovision almost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed it was. I was almost tempted to give my, my point score uh, for the, comp for the uh, audio so far. My name is Andrew Mary. I'm the head of futures at Planetthon, and I'm also a sustainability scientist. And it's also a pleasure to be joining you here today. And you have the coolest title ever, Head of Futures. Um, I like that a lot. And I think we always want to start with the students. So please, Andrew, can I, can I start to ask you, how come you even started to, as a scientist, to actually look into this space of fiction and conveying the science in this different way? Sure, so it started during my PhD, uh, which was on the future of the oceans. Uh, I was trying to understand you're reading hundreds of scientific papers and understanding that, wow, there's certain marine species that are moving hundreds, you know, thousands of kilometers. There's going to be fundamental changes in the future of the ocean. And it felt like the greatest story never told. All of this knowledge, these insights, this fundamental understanding of the different ways in which the world might change stuck behind scientific papers that maybe a few dozen or a hundred people might read. And so then I started to think, drawing on my sort of long, uh, like, fascination and love of science fiction, well, you know, is there a role for science fiction and fiction more generally where scientific, science fiction, uh, where scientific papers fall short? Could we bridge that gap? And then I started to explore using storytelling as a way of drawing out these insights and giving people a different entry point uh, into the science. And I've continued to develop that approach uh, from then. <laughs> And what is, has it been difficult to bridge the gap between science and uh, fiction? Or uh, what do you think about that collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it comes with certain challenges, but certainly in the case of developing this work with 
with with Spotify and working with these like really talented authors, it was incredible that we would pull, you know, I pulled together sort of the start of a story, which was built on a lot of different kind of key scientific insights of ways in which the world might change. And then it was really fascinating to see what the storytellers were able to kind of pull out and really highlight, and how often it might not be that the story that is created, these, ra- these very immersive radio dramas, contain all of the specific scientific facts, but they really reflect the core kind of messages, the key values, the important insights that are really necessary. Because that's what people often forget, that you know, it's not just about the kind of numbers and the very, very specifics, it's also about these large movements and shifts in the way that the world is changing and what that means for humanity. And I think storytelling is such a great way to be able to tap into that element of science, which is often not brought to the forefront. And I mean, Emma, you have really done that work as well, uh, taking in science to a lot of the different content that you have. Uh, how did you start off with this and, and uh, how have you done your way of working with this? Well, I loved uh, those comments because I was trained as a scientist um, and had a similar revelation. Um, it sounds like during uh, mm. a similar degree. Uh, in which I was trained to understand things empirically, to present things in charts and graphs. And frankly, most of my colleagues in the scientific field look down upon storytelling, I think, to their immense detriment. And now you're starting to see, ironically, scientific articles coming out. I was just reading one in the National Academy of Sciences, talking about how, in fact, the scientific community has really hurt ourselves in not prioritizing the communication of science to non-experts. We were trained that the plural of an anecdote is not data, but that doesn't mean that an anecdote is not powerful. In fact, when it comes to uh, something that is considered threatening to humans, they tend to respond better to anecdote or to story than they do to logic and science. And I think climate change easily qualifies uh, as threatening to to humanity. So I'm learning a lot uh, now working at an entertainment company. And, you know, we are here as a team inside the company to support the creators, the storytellers, the filmmakers, the, the showrunners, depending upon whether you're in film or television, who want to weave sustainability into their uh, stories in authentic uh, accurate and entertaining ways. And so we're here as a, as a research resource, as a brainstorming partner, um, and we are frankly overwhelmed with the level of demand that we're hearing uh, from creators who have traditionally been interested in these topics, but have found them uh, very difficult to wrestle with into a character attribute or into a setting or a scene or a piece of dialogue because they have seemed overwhelming or complicated or depressing. And so that's what we're here to do is, is to help empower them um, with information uh, and with hopefully some inspiration. And I really think that's an interesting aspect because we need to meet halfway. So scientists need to be a little bit closer to creators and creators closer to the science uh, scientists. Uh, how are some of the ways, because you said you really support their creators in that aspect. What are some of the kind of, do you do meetups with scientists or what are some of the concrete guidance that they get? Well, we do have a scientific advisory group um, and we have some of the top science communicators in the world uh, on that group, including Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, Dr. Johan Rockström, who was actually featured in a documentary that Netflix put out um, with Sir David Attenborough, who describes Dr. Rockstrom as the best science communicator he's encountered in his day. Um, but we also internally uh, offer up a number of resources, tip sheets, uh, and bespoke consultations where we will um, be asked to go research a particular topic or bring in uh, one of the world's experts on a particular uh, niche area that my team can't possibly cover. Uh, every uh, possible uh, s- subject that, that that relates to sustainability, since these choices, frankly, touch um, every element of our lives. So that's the sort of thing um, that we do. And then, of course, it's up to the creators whether or not they, they take our notes, uh, suggestions, and research. But at least it's there for them. 
um, to pick up. And how was it on, on your side? How did um, Spotify end up doing a climate podcast or a climate science fiction one and not a, a climate scientist doing a pod? sustainability work at Spotify. Uh, we of course looked at our own impact, as I said, but also looking at kind of where do we have the potential to really drive change? Where are we uniquely positioned to drive change? And that is, I mean, through our reach and through content. Uh, and our, our first thought discussing was uh, ending up, I'm, I'm taking you on my kind of thought of trail here. So it's, it's like science. We need to get the science to the people, right? We need to have like people telling the facts and then change will happen. And then we thought about it a little bit more and said like, okay, well, is that really the problem? Is the problem that people don't know the facts and the science? Well, maybe not. And then we kind of ended up and it's like, but people don't feel it enough. And how do you kind of, how do you get to people's feelings? Uh, and that's really through stories to getting kind of to the heart rather than to the brain. So then we initiated this, this kind of climate fiction, as we call it. Um, and of course, I mean, that wasn't easy to begin with, or I mean, just thinking about it, uh, before we got to know Andrew, for example, we thought like, okay, how will a scientist, if you put a scientist together with the creators, I mean, how will that work out? Uh, will we have a scientist sitting and you have to be exactly according to the facts? I'm just going to wait here before the, before the catering passes by. Uh, and will the creators be, I mean, could they take kind of directions from a scientist? Um, but then there was actually such a lovely collaboration to watch on from the side. Uh, and I, I would love Andrew to kind of discuss a bit more on that. But it was such a great way of kind of combining two worlds and really having uh, the, the inspiration from science. And I think w what you described, Andrew, was that this re really tight collaboration where the creators kind of really enjoyed this having frames to it. And how, again, how do you put the story in this future? And I think what is really, really, I mean, we're in this kind of explorative phase of this, kind of trying to figure out, of course, with inspiration from Netflix and companies kind of who's done this uh, for a longer time, but trying to figure out kind of what works, what gets kind of both the attention, what do people want to listen to? Because we know that creating a climate podcast, people here in this room, people at COP might listen, but we're not going to reach the broader mass. So how do we get into kind of mainstream content and content that you don't listen to because you're a climate nerd, but rather kind of the broad mass? And kind of also trying to look at kind of how do we, what are it in these stories that people are attracted to? What do they talk about and what do they like? And I think this Rangina is such a good, great example where you have I mean, you listen to the short segment and the, the, the world here is in ashes. Um, but then there's another segment, people don't, don't, don't think about that. They don't talk about, okay, will my children survive? Uh, they talk about another segment from, the, from this episode where it's coffee is very scarce. So people go like, okay, yes, the world is in ashes, but is it true? Will there not be coffee in the future? <laughs> and I've heard that, so I think that's really interesting also to think about kind of what is it that people can kind of take in and that is very kind of relatable but also tangible enough that they can kind of react to. It feels like I'm going to steal two questions from you there to Andrew. So Andrew, first of all, how come, you know, people like, what's the secret? Why do people like to work with you? I mean, I think that... Um, you know, one of the creators described me as, I mean, it was his words, not mine, So, but he said, I'm the scientist with the soul of a, a storyteller. And I think that picking up on, on what uh, Emma said also, that I think there are many scientists that have that storyteller soul within themselves, but they've been constantly trained and told to keep it locked up. Don't let it out. Don't tell anyone that uh, that you have emotions, that you can relate to certain characters, that you want to kind of connect the the story of the science that you're involved in for many, many years. And so I think it's about being willing to kind of be brave e enough to embrace that part uh, that I think many scientists uh, have inside them and move towards storytellers. And then of course, in this collaboration, as a scientist, I can only get so far, you know, I can start to hint at certain aspects of the narrative and then to see how that's like taken up, developed, deepened, given emotional layers, uh, and enriched is really powerful and that then both strengthens it as a story but also builds kind of strength in the way that you're able to get across uh, scientific messages and facts also. I like that, that it's more amplifying what's already there than just discovering something completely new. I like that, that everyone has that grain of, of kind and uh, storytelling within them. Uh, and before I, I, I turn to Emma, because I have a question for you as well, but um, is it true then about coffee? <laughs> Will there be no coffee? 
It's certainly possible. I mean, coffee is a really fascinating um, you know, scientific topic, you can say. I mean, we know that many of the areas that grow coffee are very vulnerable to climate change. We know that with sort of increased climate impacts, there's an increasing chance of new pests, pathogens, invasive species. We know that coffee, there's basically two varieties of coffee and there was a huge scientific effort in the 1970s to even save the predominant variety of coffee that was in play then. We became very uh, close to at least losing one of them. So this kind of fact that unfortunately this represents many of the kind of production systems and a lot about our food system that it's become really simple we've sort of reduced a lot of biodiversity and that means that things that even something like coffee which you know i'm here from sweden and i think that the swedes and the Finns might have a fight as to which country uh, has more of a deeper relationship to coffee but it is a absolutely central cultural concept and so the idea that you could lose that is completely unbelievable for many but from a scientific perspective we we have to realize that uh, a lot of these things that we take for granted can shift in really unexpected ways and even our coffee isn't safe i always think of margaret atwood who says it's not climate change it's everything change and that's really about, I mean, telling a lot of different stories and a lot of different perspectives because it needs to be something that is close to, to home or close to your heart. So you actually take action. Uh, and I think that's something that you have done so brilliantly at Netflix, Emma, because you have told really, you not only done this, a few documentaries, but you really looked at so many different ways of adding piece of sustainability information here and there, almost planting it naturally in a story. Can't you tell us a little bit more about that? I would love to, but I do want to clarify that's not Netflix. Those are our creators who, um, as part of their craft, are wanting to weave that in. We simply support them in doing it accurately. Um, and, you know, they're ultimately the determinants of, of whether it's authentic to the character or to the plot or to the era. We've had multiple consultations with titles, you might be able to guess, um, that are based in uh, different centuries than, than today, and yet really want to, to highlight some of the environmental challenges of that era. Uh, so we, we, we uh, put our historian hats on uh, in those instances. But yes, you're absolutely right, Hannah. We have, it turns out, over 200 different film and television series on the platform right now that touch on sustainability, either at the premise level, um, like a, a Don't Look Up, or an Our Great National Parks with Barack Obama, or at the contribution level, like Ada Twist Scientist, which is a charming um, children's program with uh, Barack, uh, excuse me, Michelle Obama. Uh, you have very popular series like Virgin River um, that touch on some of the challenges in rural areas, um, as well as uh, some of the opportunities. You have Sweet Magnolias, which is very popular in uh, more conservative parts of uh, this country in the United States, which talks a lot about organic farming and how yummy and frankly how sexy the organic farmer is. And there's a there's a through line there of a crush between the main character and the organic farmer. And you have wonderfully thrilling uh, spellbinding fantasies like Ragnarok based uh, in part on the Nordic mythology uh, of the same name, but in which it's been retold and the the uh, villains here are the polluters. And in the backdrop, the glaciers are melting. Uh, so it doesn't need to be the central plot uh, of the film or of the television series for it to be effective. And in fact, there's so many more rich ways to weave it in, uh, no matter what the genre, uh, rom-com, indie, uh, animated film, uh, sea Beast is another recent example. One of our most popular animated films ever uh, has a, a really strong conservation uh, th theme throughout uh, and a wonderful uh, young heroine uh, who opens the eyes of her community, all of society in, in the film, to the fact that these sea beasts, as, as they're called, have been vilified unfairly, uh, which sounds a lot like what has happened to sharks. Uh, and whales in the course of human history. So, so many rich, entertaining, authentic ways for these realities to be woven in, no matter whether it's fiction or nonfiction. 
I, I see in. that you want to add, Eva, <laughs> yes. so go ahead. I just want to jump in because I, I love this and I think it's so inspiring and really a true, a true inspiration for us. Um, I mean, for us, we're really in the kind of hop- hypothesis stage of thinking like if people hear the stories, they feel they will probably like think and then act. But we haven't, we haven't yet tested that hypothesis. Have you done any research on the kind of the effect or the impact of including this in stories? Have research bodies have done impact studies on our titles. We tend not to do that. We have quite a few, so that would be quite time consuming. But we do take to heart their findings on, on those select titles. And then we partner with a nonprofit called Count Us In, who builds tailored uh, online impact sites for viewers of the show to go and to take uh, science-driven actions and to feel part of a community of people who are doing the same. And each site is really um, loyal to the characters and to the storylines, but the steps that the uh, viewer is encouraged to take are all grounded in uh, science that has been backed by Project Drawdown, uh, by NG by a variety of peer reviewers who said, yes, indeed, these are the highest impact actions that an individual or a household can take. And there's 20 of them. Uh, and people are often surprised what are on that short list. They, at least in the United States, assume that it's recycling. It is not. Uh, it actually, the top two actions have to do with avoiding food waste and reading, uh, eating a plant-rich diet. And food comes up in almost every show when you think about it. So there's just an enormous opportunity to portray both of those things, even without mentioning them uh, in plot lines and in scripts. So that is one thing we have been experimenting with is coupling a given title, like a Don't Look Up, like an Our Great National Parks. And actually this week, Down to Earth with Zac Efron launches today, uh, season two, an Emmy award-winning show and that will also be coupled with uh, a Count Us In impact campaign website. Then it feels like you have some concrete steps to do here uh, right after this, both in terms of what you need to watch and listen to. And also you heard it was food waste and that coffee is running out. So make sure to drink up every single bit of the coffee as well. So you have concrete things to do there. Unfortunately, we need to wrap up. But before I let the panelists go, given that we are Spotify, we always have to ask a music related question. So I want to hear, because we all know that we have huge tasks ahead of us. So it's important to keep up the kind of the energy and the inspiration and the hope. And uh, usually you have that one song that you listen to, to actually get that energi- energy that you need. So I'm going to start and ask the panel. And given that, I'll let Emma and Andrew have a little bit more time. So Ebba, you have to go first. This is a big challenge for me because I've been in those discussions before. We have this in our podcast uh, and I, I had a year to kind of think about a cool song uh, and I haven't managed to because my, my um, so you promise not to laugh when I tell you my kind of inspiration song uh, and it's just can't wait to be king from the Lion King. Uh, I can recommend it, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> Andrew, you want to go next? Sure. So I'm going to be very on brand here uh, with science fiction and thinking about the kind of epic scale of the challenge we're facing. And that's the the Dune soundtrack by Hans Zimmer. I think it's like got so much like energy and uh, fire behind it and really makes me want to kind of get out there and change the world. I have the Batman soundtrack, so I'm, I'm kind of on your thinking. Emma, you want to close us off with a good playlist addition? I would love to. For anyone who has seen Don't Look Up, in there is an anthem called Just Look Up, uh, written and sung by Ariana Grande and Kid Cudi. Uh, And it's very on the nose as to what will happen if we don't act on climate. Uh, In fact, I was joking with the filmmakers that if it weren't so difficult to sing, it might, in fact, become the anthem of the climate movement. But she gets notes that none of us can read, which is in some ways impressive and in other ways unfortunate. Um, but we have seen use of um, Just Look Up as a slogan for the climate movement on the streets uh, uh, throughout multiple countries. So if only some of us could um, could reach those notes, I think that that might be a bit of, a, of an anthem uh, for all of us at COP. 
Amazing. We'll, we'll go home and practice. So thank you once again for joining us across the world and also Ebba for being here. And thank you for listening in. Uh, so make sure to listen and watch and we'll speak soon again. Thank you. Thank you so much.